Secretary, trade deals, tax cuts, Supreme Court justices, promises made and promises for the first time were kept. This is a fight for freedom versus oppression, for opportunity versus stagnation, a fight to keep America true to America. As Vice President Mike Pence, Kellyanne Conway, and more top Trump supporters prepare to speak on the third night of the Republican National Convention. He loves this country, and he knows how to get things done. Good evening, I'm Chuck Todd. Welcome to NBC News' special coverage of the 2020 Republican National Convention on NBC News Now. We are just about 30 minutes from the start of the third night of this convention. But whatever message Republicans want to amplify tonight and tomorrow, let's be realistic. It's going to be complicated by two major news stories. A hurricane hitting the Texas-Louisiana border, and not just any hurricane, a catastrophic one. And then the protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, following a police shooting. We're going to have more on those in a moment. Tonight, the keynote address will be delivered by the Vice President, Mike Pence, from historic Fort McHenry in Baltimore, where bombs bursting in air during the War of 1812 inspired Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner. We now know the President will be attending the speech. Of course, we've seen Republicans use this week's convention to blend symbols of patriotism, politicize patriotism a bit, and presidential power with campaign politics like no campaign has ever done before. And we expect a lot more of that tonight and tomorrow when the president delivers his primetime address from the grounds of the White House. But as I said, this convention is now in the back burner of America's attention. It's happening as Hurricane Laura is expected to make landfall near the Texas-Louisiana border late tonight or early tomorrow morning. Forecasters are warning that this Category 4 storm will cause catastrophic damage and meteorologists use this term, unsurvivable storm surge. 30 miles inland, they're concerned about storm surge here. Don't mess around with this hurricane, folks. And as the country continues to grapple with issues of policing and racial justice, there's unrest in Wisconsin after Jacob Blake, a black man, was shot multiple times in the back by police. Players uh, in the NBA basically said enough is enough. The NBA had a, was forced to postpone all of tonight's playoff games after the Milwaukee Bucks decided not to take the floor in protest of the shooting and pretty much every other NBA team joined the Bucks in that decision as well, forcing the league to do what it did. So joining me now from Fort McHenry, Maryland, where the vice president will speak tonight. We expect the president is my NBC News colleague, Hallie Jackson. And Hallie, this is the third Republican convention uh, in, the last, in the last four that has had a night potentially disrupted by a major hurricane. But that is, Boy. weirdly enough, not the most important, perhaps, story impacting this convention. It may be Wisconsin, considering how important that state is in overall. What do we expect from the vice yeah. president tonight? We know he, is a, he does usually have a nod towards the news. What do we expect? He does. Yeah, you're, you're not wrong about that, Chuck. So here's what I can tell you based on a conversation I just had with a source familiar with the vice president's speech and his remarks here tonight. He will likely speak broadly about race and police shootings. As for the hurricane, he is likely to touch on that, Chuck. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised to hear it. As you correctly know, the vice president often will work news of day themes into whatever speech he's giving that day. Overall, though, this is going to be a speech that is heavy on patriotism and I'm told heavy on policy as well. You mentioned the setting. I have to tell you, it's a beautiful night here in Baltimore. You and I spoke last night when we were on the Rose Garden, uh, mm -hmm. out on the, the, the White House grounds. Yeah. Rainstorm, that is not the case here. Uh, and it is, it, it, it's a historic site. You can see the audience members, if I step out a little bit, you can see people starting to gather here. Uh, right. Not a lot of masks, at least that I'm seeing as it relates to COVID. Uh, but the, president, the vice president will talk about sort of what this country means, what this flag means, but he'll also try to draw some policy contrast with Joe Biden. You know, Chuck, the sort of position that Mike Pence has when it right. comes to conservatives, perhaps a unique position as compared to his boss, Donald Trump. Right. And so I'm told that Pence will really try to make the conservative case here tonight as well. And then there's that word we've heard all three nights of this convention so far, optimism, that Pence will present mm. a brighter vision. On night one, there was a lot of talk of optimism. The tone was more apocalypseism. Night two felt a little bit felt a little bit different than that. We'll see what night three holds. I should also mention, Chuck, that while the vice president will speak here, there's still plenty of action back home in Washington at the right. Mellon Auditorium where we've seen these speeches. You're going to see staff members, including Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany, speak. And it might be a different right. Kayleigh than what you're used to seeing uh, McEnany from the podium. 
She right. is going to be more personal, we're told, share stories of her personal relationship with the president and not so much be right. perhaps combative or throw red meat to the base. And then Kellyanne Conway, just a few days, Chuck, before she is set to leave the right. administration, she says to go focus on her family. You know, the, the public, Fort McHenry has been closed to the public basically since the start of the pandemic. And the, it only has been forced to open twice for political events by the president here. Right. Um, they keep, is there, obviously they don't care if they're pushing this envelope. Does anybody tell them no in the government? Does anybody tell them no who, in the legal office? Who would do that? Right. Uh, listen, the, the council has uh, essentially, we, we've heard from advisors who say the council has signed off on this, in effect. I'm told there well, were that doesn't make it legal. That staff members <laughs> heard about issues. I, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that is something that's going to be decided, you know, in the months to come here. The, the White House, frankly, is doing what it's going to do. And I think for all the discussion about the Hatch Act, for all the discussion about what you're pointing out, opening, you know, closed historical sites like this one, uh, the right. president feels like it is what he wants to do. I'll tell you, you and I also talked about ratings and sort of where the president's head is at. I've been talking to folks uh, close to that inner circle there, close to the president, uh, and he feels like, I'm told, it's been a good production so far. All right. Very interesting. Hallie Jackson, uh, thank you. Let's head now to Newport Ritchie, Florida, where our own Dasha Burns is talking to voters. President Trump is looking to reach this week. We'll see if he's reaching them. Dasha? Hey, Chuck, well, Pasco County is home to a large population of voters over the age of 65, and they are what gave him a major victory here in 2016. He didn't just improve the GOP margin here. He pretty much blew it out of the water. He won by 21 points. Compare that to 2012 when Romney won here by seven points. And Chuck, just to set up what I'm about to show you here, I have learned that in Florida, if you want to talk to retirees on a sweltering hot day like today, you got to book it to the nearest swimming pool. So that's exactly what we did. We went straight for the water aerobics, Chuck, to catch up with some voters. And uh, the question I came with was, does that enthusiasm from 2016 still hold, particularly in a state that has been so hard hit by the pan pandemic and a demographic that has also been so hard hit? And Chuck, the resounding answer that I heard was yes. And when I asked the why question, what is it that the president has done to improve their lives over the last three and a half years? Uh, take a listen to what I heard. Is there anything you can sort of point to that he has said he'd do and that he's done that, that, that you're really happy with? Not that I could think of. I'm just glad he's there. Like I said, I feel secure. Well, he hasn't really done anything with my life, but uh, I think he's brought into some other people's lives the job that he increased, uh, you know, stuff like that. I, you know, I just, I feel that comfortable with him. I just don't trust Biden. I just don't. He, he's not the typical guy from the swamp up there. Chuck, I couldn't get a lot of specifics on that question of what has he actually done for these folks. But when we talk about that message uh, from, from Trump that he's been hammering, the, the law and order message, and we ask, well, who is this actually working with? Well, this is a group where it actually does seem to be resonating. Interestingly, more than the coronavirus pandemic, the biggest concern that I heard from folks was what they described as lawlessness uh, in American cities. One man even told me he was worried that the riots might be coming to his uh, community. Mm. So that, that does seem to be hitting home with, with this demographic here, Chuck. Sounds like he's seeing a lot of video images on his TV screen being piped in from, uh, from, from other places. Dasha Burns, Pasco County, boy, that he did, he, the turnout in Pasco County is what helped Trump so much in 2016. The key question there is not winning it, is whether he gets, as you said, that same enthusiastic turnout there. Uh, mm -hmm. Dasha Burns uh, in uh, Florida there. Dasha, thanks very much. Joining me now, my NBC News colleague, Casey Hunt. She's also host of Casey DC Sundays on MSNBC. And Lonnie Chen, former advisor to Mitt Romney. Casey, look, I think tonight is a, a bit of a challenge for, for the convention. And I am going to be curious to watch how in touch and in tune are they with what's happening in America tonight, right? That, to me, will be of interest to me as we watch the night uh, go on. Well, and as I was watching that scene at Fort McHenry and, you know, we have we watched Melania Trump in the Rose Garden last night, all of the ways that this president is using the trappings of the presidency, perhaps unethically, 
to try and elevate himself. He's facing the flip side of this now, right, which is that as the incumbent, he is responsible for trying to help Americans that are in the path of this storm. And we're hearing, you know, such terrible warnings about what this could actually be like for so many Americans who are living in its path. And this is not something that he necessarily has a great track record on in the past. Um, and certainly, as we have watched him try uh, to battle the COVID uh, pandemic, you know, that has underscored his, you know, failures in, in using right. government infrastructure uh, and mobilizing our resources to try and fight back against something that, you know, the government has some responsibility for. So, you know, I think that's really a challenge here, especially on a night when they're trying to appeal, it seems particularly to the suburban women who have abandoned his campaign, at least at this point. Chuck. You know, Lonnie, every one of these unexpected events that have put, been put on the president's desk, the pandemic, hurricane responses, um, uh, and the racial justice protests. His initial handling has not gone over well with the public. The public has sent him a message. In fact, you could argue the real hit he took, COVID was one thing. It was the mishandling of the protests that really, I think, added to this, this second dip that he got in the late spring. I think there's a risk tonight if it looks like he's more worried about puffing up his own political biography. He's got a job to do right now, real work, you know, which is hurricane relief. Uh, we've got this, uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of unrest in the streets and whether you wanna say he's, in, he's impacted it or not, he's the leader of this country. I, he's gotta be seen as doing something. Well, the buck stops with the president. That's the, regardless of who the president is. I mean, you know, natural disasters are one thing. You know, there, there seems to be a thing with hurricanes and a magnetic attraction to the Republican National Convention. <laughs> you know, in, in 2012, when I, uh, when I was working for, for Mitt Romney, you remember yeah. we had to blow out the first day of the convention yeah. because, the, because, the, because the hurricane came through. So, you know, natural you disasters refused, are one thing. Are you sure it was the hurricane or it was just because Donald Trump was supposed to speak that night? Remember that also well, happened to cancel it was a hurricane. Donald it was a hurricane, Trump's night. But, you know, I was, <laughs> I was with, I flew maybe to check out that hurricane damage with Mitt Romney. I was on that plane. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think, you know, th this has always been the big challenge for, for this administration, which is how they balance the imagery of what they're trying to portray with the reality of what's out there. Uh, you know, the big thing with COVID, you're right, the initial response was one thing, but what happened post uh, Memorial Day, when you saw the cases begin to spike in the Southwest and then eventually throughout the country, that was the bigger challenge. In this case, we've had sort of one round of um, real gut-wrenching protests on the racial injustice issues. Now we seem to be coming into another. And, and the question is, what is the administration's response going to look like? And I think trying to manage all of that while at the same time dealing with putting on a national convention you know, it is a big challenge, and it's a big challenge for any seated administration. But in particular, the incumbency advantage is usually something that the president wants to use to his advantage. You've talked about the symbolism of the presidency. The problem is that the incumbency also brings with it tremendous responsibility. Right. And is the president going to be able to live up to the moment? I think that's a question that voters are going to judge him on when we get to November. And, you know, Casey, uh, if, if you're, you know, there's a— Every convention campaign has this team of vetters on speeches. Sometimes they write speeches. It seems to me they better be extra careful tonight to make sure there isn't some stray language that may work with a Fox News audience that will look really off-putting on a night like tonight. Well, and that's a huge challenge here, Chuck, because we've seen them try to do both things. We have seen speeches that have clearly played directly to the president's base, to that audience uh, that is watching Fox News or even some of the other more conservative channels that have gained popularity in the course of the last three or four years. And we've also seen them try to reach out to a broader audience in some ways with their videos and with speeches from people like Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, uh, arguably Melania Trump, uh, whose speech had a, a slightly different, different tone uh, than some of the others. But you're right that you know, they've also been trying to push this law and order message. And in some ways, that could work better in the aftermath. You know, certainly yeah. we are a couple of months away from the George Floyd protests. But when all of a sudden this is flared up, there's another new horrifying video with a man whose children were in the car, who is shot in the back, who may be paralyzed. I mean, it's right there for everybody to see. And 
to Lonnie's point, Donald Trump is the president. And while on the one hand you want to argue, uh, you know, we want to enforce the laws, right. on the other hand, you got to have the law before you have the order, first of all. And second of all, chaos is not something you want on your watch period the end if you're the president. Hey, Lonnie, I'm curious, you know, last night was, I felt like it was an attempt at, at sort of trying to not fix the president's image, but maybe round the edges of it, whether it's with women, with immigrants, with African Americans. But then you see his Twitter feed during the day, and you see some of the, uh, do you think this stuff ends up ringing hot? You know, it, it almost, it looks too ham-handed. Oh, they're trying to do something. Oh, but that's the real Trump over here. He just tweeted at me. Well, I mean, this is the issue, right, is that the people around the president are not going to be able to control what he does. So if he's going to go out there and tweet in a way that potentially undermines the message of last night's convention speakers, there's, there's nothing they can do. So the best they can do is to put on a convention to do exactly as you've said, which is to round the edges, to make the president's uh, t you know, tougher parts and the things about him that may be less attractive, more attractive, particularly to the core audiences that they're trying to speak to. In this case, it's the suburbs and continuing to hold that support in the exurbs. There's no other way to do it but to put on a program like they put on last night. But yes, the risk is always that the mm -hmm. president himself decides he's going to say something that takes it off message. And there is nothing that any right. of his handlers, that any convention planner, that any staff member can do about the president. He is his yeah. own best friend and worst enemy in this regard. Yeah, it's going to happen. You just don't know what time it happens. Casey Hunt, Lonnie Chen, stick with us up ahead. Why so many Republican senators have decided not to show up for the Republican convention? Steve Kornacki joins us at the big board, but first a memorable moment from a past Republican convention. Let's go back to 2008, when a certain running mate became the primetime speaker of a convention. Then Alaska Governor Sarah Palin accepted the VP nomination and introduced a phrase into the political lexicon. I was just your average hockey mom and signed up for the PTA. I love those hockey moms. You know, they say the difference between a hockey mom and a pit bull, lipstick. Here's a little news flash for those reporters and commentators. I'm not going to Washington to seek their good opinion. I'm going to Washington to serve the people of this great country. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment where we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. George W. Bush when we served as governors together. I admire this man, and I like the fact that he's the same man on Saturday night that he is on Sunday morning. He is not a slick talker, but he is a straight shooter. And where I come from, deeds mean a lot more than words. That was then Democratic Georgia Senator Zell Miller speaking to Republicans at the 2004 Republican convention. He ended up officially joining the party four years later. Just six Republican senators are taking part in this year's convention. And the only one who's in a tough re-election fight this fall is speaking tonight. It's Iowa Senator Joni Ernst. Republicans trying to keep control of the Senate may be afraid to tie themselves too closely to the president. NBC Steve Kornacki is at the big board to break down this Senate map. And, and on one hand, Steve, we're not surprised, but look, on the other side of the aisle, a lot more Democratic senators did participate in their convention. Yeah, and Democrats are certainly playing offense when it comes to the Senate. They got 47 now. Assuming Biden wins, we'll assume that just from the standpoint of Democrats trying to get the presidency. If Biden wins, Democrats need a net gain of three seats to get them what they want here, the presidency, the Senate, and the House. So let's look at it from that standpoint. They need a net gain of three. These are all the seats that are up this year. Now, a lot of these are not competitive races. So let's take a look at where the parties are most bullish right now. Start right here. And I think the first thing you see is when we say the Democrats need a net gain of three, it really might be four because this is a top Republican target. Doug Jones, Democrat, in Alabama, won that special election against Roy Moore a few years ago. Polling right now has Jones behind in that race. If Republicans do get that, Democrats need then a net gain of four seats. That's the bad news for them there. The good news for them, though, is there are four races right now. You have four Republican incumbents right here who, in the polling right now, are trailing. These are top Democratic targets right now. Look at that, North Carolina, Tom Tillis trailing by eight, trailing by the most of any of these. So if the Democrats lose Alabama, they need a net gain of four. There are four very clear targets right here. And let's take a look at what that looks like in our Senate what if map. These are the states I just showed you. If Alabama goes to the Republicans and the Democrats can pick up these four, you'll see it right here. Puts them at 50. That with the Biden presidency would put them in control. But let's say something goes wrong for them in one of those states. For instance, let's say Tillis makes a comeback, wins North Carolina. Republicans, oh, there it is. They got the majority. That's where a state like Iowa comes into play, because take a look at this. There are a bunch of other Republican seats here. South Carolina, those two seats in Georgia, won a special election. Joni Ernst in Iowa, Montana. Democrats have Steve Bullock running there. These are also, to varying degrees, potential targets for Democrats. Iowa, in fact, the polling has been very close in Iowa. Teresa Greenfield, the Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, Democrats optimistic there. What if Tillis pulls out North Carolina, but then Joni Ernst loses that race? In Iowa, again, Biden win in the presidential race, that would get them 50. You know, Georgia could have a special election after the election. There are options here for Democrats besides those core races we started with. More options for Democrats. They're playing offense. And not only that, there's two other states that they might target, and that's Kansas and Alaska. Yep. Um, and we're not bringing up Texas, you know, and, and you don't know if that pops in. But we're not counting Texas. The Alaska and Kansas, it, in fact, don't be surprised if Alaska is one that ends up a lot more competitive in the next two months uh, of all of those potential red states in that second tier of races there. Anyway, Steve Kornacki, uh, it is pretty exciting in the Senate battlefield. Um, yep. There's a lot of competitive races. You Thank you, it. sir. Thanks, sir. Let's go back to Casey Hunt and Lonnie Chen are back with me. Casey, uh, Mitch McConnell is going to be speaking tomorrow. 
at first he wasn't going to be speaking at this convention. It, it almost, you were like, wow, even the majority leader doesn't want to be there too. Um, how nervous are they? You know, I think they're pretty nervous, Chuck. And yeah, that was a rare mistake by the McConnell campaign. They're usually pretty flawless. And initially they had said, nope, not speaking at the convention. And then a couple hours later, they had to take it back and say, actually, we're taping something that's going to air on Thursday night. But, you know, this map has changed. And, you know, as you know, and I also am fascinated by the Senate map because I feel like it's driving a lot of the decision making on the part of McConnell and others in Washington. Um, they're running behind President Trump in a lot of these states. So yes. that is part of why they're in such a difficult position in terms of how they interact with and relate to the president, because they're afraid that if they anger the voters that are at least, you know, his base that are coming out for them and likely to vote for them as well, they really don't have any options because it's clear swing voters and independents uh, seem to be trending away uh, from, uh, seem to be trending away from, from them, if not from Trump. And I think the big question is, is there this set of voters that are only Trump voters? Are they showing up to only right. vote for Donald Trump and they're either ignoring the Senate races or they're splitting their votes, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I think Iowa is a fascinating race to watch. I would keep an eye on Montana. Honestly, yeah. that was one that was not really on the radar and suddenly popped up there. And I think you're right also about Alaska. And, you know, yeah. I think the sense is, you know, if one of these goes, they're probably all going to go, so we could see a major landslide. We could. You know, Lonnie, it's interesting. There's sort of two tiers of these Republican vulnerable seats. There's that first tier we were talking about that, that Steve talked about. They're in sort of the blue or purple states. They're, they're losing swing voters, and, and you could see that, that Trump is a problem. But then you've got people like South Carolina, or you've got uh, even a Dan Sullivan, or you've got the situation of Steve Daines in, in Montana, where they're all underperforming Trump. And yet... They've, so there's a tendency, Lindsey Graham, on one hand, if he just gets the Trump number, he wins. But that's one of his problems. So there's sort of weird political problems some of these incumbent Republican senators have in these red-leaning states. Well, and that's why you see them uh, holding on so tightly to President Trump, and you see them trying to associate themselves so closely, Lindsey Graham being the prime example, someone who in 2016 actively campaigned against Donald Trump has now become one of his closest partners in crime. And I think you see that sort of association, that very close association, because there's a recognition that they've got to turn out the Trump base if they have any chance of, of, of winning or if they want to win. They're going to need that support. And it's about more than getting that support. It's about really trying to reach the same level of enthusiasm. When you talk about looking at how likely a voter is to turn out, uh, if you're looking at this from the campaign perspective, you don't just care that someone's going to turn out. You want them very likely to turn out. You want the high intensity voters. And the only way you get there, if you are a Lindsey Graham or if you are a Sullivan, is by embracing the president and trying to take everything from the president's brand that you can to get his voters excited about you. You know, Casey Hunt, I, I will admit to being mildly surprised that Joni Ernst agreed to speak be, because she's in such a close race. But Iowa appears to be, there might be fewer persuadable voters, and this may be what Lonnie says, a turnout, uh, really more of a turnout game. I, I think that's entirely possible, Chuck. And, you know, she really has. And I, I, I'm with you in, in my surprise as well, because there have been some areas in which she is willing to be independent. But I think in public, mm -hmm. she has been one of the senators who has been the most uh, supportive and effusive, perhaps, uh, about President Trump, e even as privately uh, there's been some frustration with trade policies, with responses to disasters and other potential issues. So, uh, you know, she's really making a bet that, yeah, she really needs Republicans uh, to get out. And, you know, I think the question, too, the, the flip side of this, uh, and if I'm Lindsey Graham, you know, he's tweeted out some things that have surprised, that certainly didn't sound like primary uh, Lindsey Graham to me uh, over the course of, of the last couple of months since he won that primary. And, you know, I wonder if... Jamie Harrison isn't able to get voters excited to turn out against Lindsey Graham the more that he embraces Trump. So that's a dynamic I'm watching. Well, it's it, I will admit that's probably my favorite down ballot race to watch uh, because there's so many odd, interesting dynamics to it, including a demographic change that's taking place in South Carolina as well. For Casey sure. Hunt, Lonnie Chen, thank you both. Thank you uh, for all for being with us this hour. The program for night three of the Republican National Convention starts right now. Long before the shots fired at Concord, 
were men and women of remarkable character and fortitude. An extraordinary spirit fueled the dreams they held. That spirit lived on to win liberty in the revolution. It emboldened the underground railroads. It strengthened the brave souls at Normandy. It endured with those who gallantly fought the spread of communism. And on 9-11, that same spirit was found in the men and women storming the gates of death to save precious lives. The spirit of heroism thrives in the presence of tyranny, disaster. It is stronger than any virus. Yet there are those who condemn our heroes, seek to erase history and deconstruct the American ideal, remake America into something it was never intended to be. But the spirit of heroism stands in the breach. It lives in the heart, it breathes in the soul, and is woven into the courageous fabric of Americans like you. It preserves liberty. It strengthens families. It empowers the extraordinary. The spirit of heroism inspires us to act when others are in need. To do the right thing. Join us tonight. Dream heroic dreams. Celebrate America. Land of the free. Home of the brave. Washington, D.C. Welcome to the 2020 Republican National Convention. Tonight, celebrating America as the land of heroes. Lord, almighty God, we come before you this evening and pray for your divine protection over our brothers and sisters in the path of storms along our Gulf Coast. You are our rock and our shelter in the midst of the storms of life. You are the God who commands the winds and the waves, and we pray that you will provide refuge to our people. O oh Lord, you have granted us certain natural rights such as the right to speak freely, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, as well as religious freedom, the right to assemble, and the right to self-defense. Only in America have these God-given rights so flourished and been categorized as belonging to the people, embodying the very essence of our government. Father, we pray that this outlook and mindset, this form of government continues, as has been our history, especially now when to our horror it is being challenged. And so we pray that God gives strength and health to our president, who has splendidly demonstrated daily his determination to defend and maintain the God-given rights of our citizens, as enshrined in our Constitution and in our Declaration, eloquently passed down through our Judeo-Christian tradition. President Trump has stood up fearlessly against those who are corrupting the term social justice so as to deny Americans their birthright and these divine gifts. May God protect him. May God bless all those in government and among our citizens who seek to honor, defend, and preserve our heritage. This land was founded in an epic and providential moment. Like the revelation at Sinai, it was the moment when the vision of God rendezvoused with the soaring and noble plans of appointed men. Yet, every so often, a pace various generations, we are compelled to resurrect and give rebirth to our providential beginning to renew our present days with the exuberance of those founding days. Perhaps that is what is meant when we say, make America great again. 
we pledge to vigilantly protect and tend the garden so as to imbibe its blessed fruits. May God continue to make America great, and may we continue to be his people, one nation, under God, and let us say, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. I'm Governor Christy Noem of South Dakota. I'm here tonight because I believe America is an exceptional nation founded on three principles, equality, freedom, and opportunity. But today, our founding principles are under attack. This year, the choice for Americans is between a man who values these ideals and all that can be built because of them, and a man who isn't guided by these ideals and coincidentally has built nothing. Remember, America's battle for independence and fight for self-governance was something that had never been done before. Men of great intellect and wisdom, like James Madison, the father of our Constitution, hoped our constitutional republic would last for ages, mitigate the problems that would naturally arise from political factions, and prevent tyranny. Madison also authored much of the Bill of Rights because he understood the natural tendency of government to increasingly encroach on the people's consent, and thus, our freedom. He urged his colleagues to adopt these amendments to enshrine in our Constitution the ideals laid out in the Declaration of Independence, that all power comes from the people, that the government is created and ought to be exercised for the benefit of the people. Our Constitution guarantees the right to speak, to assemble and to worship, the right to arm ourselves as a counterbalance to a standing army, and the right to a fair and equitable criminal justice system. We must fight to protect these foundational rights from government interference and indifference. America is unique in the world. Government's power at all levels is limited to the confines of our Constitution, which protects our God-given liberties and civil rights. We are not, and will not, be the subjects of an elite class of so-called experts. We, the people, are the government. Now, at times, our country has struggled to live up to our founding principles. Another great American, Abraham Lincoln, knew that struggle better than anybody. When he was just 28 years old, Honest Abe saw wild and furious passions worse than savage mobs, he said, taking the place of reasoned judgment. He was alarmed by the increasing disregard for the rule of law throughout the country. He was concerned for the people that had seen their property destroyed, their families attacked, and their lives threatened or even taken away. These good people were becoming tired of and disgusted with a government that offered them no protection. Sound familiar? It took 244 years to build this great nation, flaws and all. But we stand to lose it in a tiny fraction of that time if we continue down the path taken by the Democrats and their radical supporters. From Seattle and Portland to Washington and New York, Democrat-run cities across this country are being overrun by violent mobs. The violence is rampant. There's looting, chaos, destruction, and murder. People that can afford to flee have fled, but the people that can't, good, hardworking Americans, are left to fend for themselves. The Republican Party's commitment to individual rights and self-government is as necessary today as it was in 1860 when we won our first presidential election. Our party respects individuals based on who they are. We don't divide people based on their beliefs or their roots. We don't shun people who think for themselves. We respect everyone equally under the Constitution, and we treat them as Martin Luther King Jr. wished, according to the content of their character, not the color of their skin. In just four years, President Trump has lifted people of all races and backgrounds out of poverty 
He shrunk government. He put money back into the pockets of hardworking, ordinary Americans. He has advanced religious liberty. He protected the Second Amendment. You can look back 50 years. You won't find anyone that has surpassed President Trump's success on these four issues alone. History chooses its heroes for the time in which they live. At our founding, Madison was one of the chosen. When the nation's very existence was challenged, it was Lincoln's turn. Thanks to these men, America is a land of hope. Their examples have been repeated in countless ways by simple Americans following their conscience. But there is another American hero to be recognized, and that is the common American. This is who President Trump is fighting for. He's fighting for you. I'm Scott Dane. I represent loggers and truckers in Minnesota, but I also represent a way of life. Logging has been a part of the great American story from the beginning. In fact, if you go to the Capitol Rotunda and look up, you can see loggers on one of the panels, New England settlers carving out a new world from the wilderness. But logging is the most dangerous job in the country, but we embrace that risk because we know America was built by strong people building things together. America needs us to keep building and we can't wait to be a part of it. But the last time Joe Biden was in the White House, Minnesota lost nearly half of its mills, thousands of jobs, and experienced nearly a decade of decline. It was a similar story in other parts of the country. The administration just didn't seem to care. In 47 years in Washington, Joe Biden hasn't done anything for the timber industry. When plants closed in Duluth, Sartell, Cook and Bemidji, they were just numbers on a paper to the Obama-Biden administration. To me, they were people and jobs and families. Under Obama-Biden, radical environmentalists were allowed to kill the forests. Wildfire after wildfire shows the consequences. Managed forests, the kind my people work in, are healthy forests. Under President Trump, we've seen a new recognition of the value of forest management in reducing wildfires. And we've seen new support for our way of life, where a strong back and a strong work ethic can build a strong middle class. We want to build families where we were raised and stand by communities that stood by us. We want that way of life available for the next generation, and we want our force there too. President Trump, thank you for helping us do just that. Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee. America is a nation of heroes. In times of difficulty, we're reminded that they're all around us. They're in the line with us at the grocery store, in the pew with us at church. They're the regular Americans who step up to volunteer and serve when we need them most. They've stood at the forefront throughout this pandemic. The emergency room nurses who go back shift after shift, the medical researchers developing a vaccine and therapies to combat what the Chinese Communist regime unleashed on the world. Cookville's Double Springs Church of Christ members lifting our country up in prayer and providing for those impacted by tragedy. But tonight, I want to talk to you about another kind of hero, the kind Democrats don't recognize because they don't fit into their narrative. I'm talking about the heroes of our law enforcement and armed services. Leftists try to turn them into villains. They want to cancel them. But I'm here to tell you these heroes can't be canceled. 
Tennessee is full of them. After all, we're the volunteer state. My dad served in the Army in World War II. When he came home, he put on another uniform and for 30 years volunteered to help our underfunded sheriff's department. I'm reminded of him whenever I see compassion and selflessness in others. When I see law enforcement officers put their lives on the line every single day to keep our community safe, in spite of the hatred thrown at them. When I see the heroes who volunteer to serve our country putting their lives on the line for our freedom, Many of these heroes call Tennessee home, and we could not be more proud of the brave men and women of the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell. The common thread between them is a deep-seated desire to serve a cause larger than themselves. They don't believe their country owes them anything. They believe they Oh, their country and their fellow man. As hard as Democrats try, they can't cancel our heroes. They can't contest their bravery. And they can't dismiss the powerful sense of service that lives deep in their souls. So they tried to defund them, our military, our police, even ICE to take away their tools to keep us safe. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and their radical allies try to destroy these heroes because if there are no heroes to inspire us, government can control us. They close our churches, but keep the liquor stores and abortion clinics open. They say we can't gather in community groups, but encourage protest, riots, and looting in the streets. If the Democrats had their way, they would keep you locked in your house until you become dependent on the government for everything. That sounds a lot like communist China to me. Maybe that's why Joe Biden is so soft on them. Why Nancy Pelosi says that China would prefer Joe Biden. Yep, I bet they would. But President Trump has stood up for our heroes every day. He stood by our law enforcement, our military, and the freedoms we hold dear. He's made good on his promise to put America first. And I hope you will stand with me as we send him back for four more years with a clear message to the Democrats, you will never cancel our heroes. Hi, I'm Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Eight years ago in the fields of Helmand Province, Afghanistan, close friend and teammate laid down cover fire against Taliban insurgents so that I could walk blind and bloodied to the medevac helicopter and survive. But he didn't. Dave Worson was killed two months later. He died a hero to this great country. Here's the truth about America. We are a country of heroes. I believe that, so should you. We are a people with a common set of ideals conceived in liberty. People that have sacrificed time and again for our freedom and the freedom of others. That's something no other country ever, anywhere, can claim. Since 9-11, I've seen America's heroes up close. Some of them saved my life. Some of them saved many others' lives. Many of them never made it home. These heroes acted as if the whole struggle depended on them alone, as if any weakness on their part would be a reflection of the whole nation. That's called duty. And America has a long history of it. Our enemies fear us because Americans fight for good, and we know it. It gives us strength. When our heroes are trusted and equipped, then freedom prevails. The defeat of ISIS was the result of America believing in our heroes, our president having their backs and rebuilding our military so we'd have what we needed to finish the mission. The cowering of the Iranian regime and the restoration of the deterrence once lost is the result of America believing in her own might again. 
But America's heroism isn't relegated to the battlefield. Every single day we see them, if you just know where to look. It's the nurse who volunteers for back-to-back -back shifts caring for COVID patients because she feels that's her duty. It's the parent who will relearn algebra because there's no way they're letting their kid fall behind while schools are closed. And it's the cop that gets spit on one day and will save a child's life the next. America is the country where the young military wife with two young children answers the unexpected knock at the door, looks the man in uniform in the eye, and even as her whole world comes crashing down, she stands up straight, she holds back tears, and takes care of her family, because she must. This is what heroism looks like. It's who we are, a nation of heroes. We need you now more than ever. We need to remind ourselves what heroism really is. Heroism is self-sacrifice. It's not moralizing and lecturing over others when they disagree. Heroism is grace, not perpetual outrage. Heroism is rebuilding our communities, not destroying them. Heroism is renewing faith in the symbols that unite us, not tearing them down. You see, America is a fabric. It's woven from the threads of history's best stories, best attributes, and greatest ideas. The American spirit reflects the oldest and most important virtues, self-sacrifice, courage, tolerance, love of country, grace, and passion for human achievement. We can decide right now that American greatness will not be rejected nor squandered. As the American founding was grounded in individual liberty, so will be our future. But if we are to rediscover our strength, then it must be an endeavor undertaken by each and every one of us. We must become the heroes that we so admire. America was built by them, and our future will be protected by them. It will be protected by you. So God bless America. Good evening. I'm retired Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg. In 1967, at the age of 22, I volunteered to serve my country in Vietnam. From the jungles of Vietnam to the deserts of Iraq, I have gone where my nation asked. I have borne witness to soldiers' last moments on earth, their lives spent in hope and promise of a better future for all Americans. I was in the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. I lost friends there that day. In the years that followed, I watched my daughter, son, and son-in-law deploy to Afghanistan. I have looked into the eyes of my grandchildren as they said goodbye to their fathers and hugged them one last time. I lived to service. I understand sacrifice. I know leadership. Over the past three and a half years, I have witnessed every major foreign policy and national security decision by the president. I have been in the room where it happened. I saw only one agenda and one guiding question when tough calls had to be made. Is this decision right for America? When President Donald Trump took office, decades of failed foreign policy had crippled us. He faced wars without end in sight, creation of failed states like Libya and Syria, a past that allowed a terrorist caliphate to grow, and leadership in Washington that allowed our military to atrophy while we spent trillions of dollars abroad instead of investing at home. President Trump has reversed the decline of our military and restructured our national security strategy. With historic investment and vision, our military is now better equipped, better resourced, and better manned than any military in the world. President Trump demolished the terrorist ISIS caliphate in the Middle East and eliminated its leader, al-Baghdadi, one of the world's most brutal terrorists. President Trump took decisive action against Iranian terrorist mastermind, Qasem Soleimani, a man responsible for deaths of hundreds of American servicemen in Iraq. When our NATO allies failed to meet their commitments as we upheld ours, President Trump demanded parity. NATO members 
have now increased their contributions over $100 billion this year. And NATO's Secretary General credits President Donald J. Trump. President Trump challenged and continues to challenge an ever increasingly provocative and militant China. But make no mistake, President Trump is no hawk. He wisely wields the sword when required, but believes in seeking peace instead of perpetual conflict. Just over a week ago, our president brokered a peace agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, the first in the Middle East in over 25 years. And this week, Afghan negotiators, with help from American officials, will start peace negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government to end America's longest war. Ask yourself, has this president kept his promises to keep us out of needless conflicts and to pursue ending wars without end? Has he defended your interests in renegotiating trade deals that previously hurt Americans in our national security? Has he fulfilled his commander-in-chief role by decisively going after our nation's enemies? You and I know the answer is yes. The choice is clear. This is the most important election of our lifetime. The next four years will decide the course of our country for decades to come. I am asking you to stand up and be counted so we never have to look back and recall what it was once like in America when men and women were free, our families were secure, and we had a president who served the people. God bless America. Thank you, and good night. Good evening. My name is Tara Myers. Tonight, I am here as a wife and mother to share how education freedom has personally impacted my family, especially the life of my son Samuel. Before Samuel was even born, I was told his life wouldn't be worth living. When early tests revealed he had Down syndrome, our doctor encouraged me to terminate the pregnancy. He said, if you do not, you will be burdening your life, your family, and your community. I knew my baby was a human being created by God, and that made him worthy of life. I am thankful that President Trump values the life of the unborn. When we went to register Samuel for kindergarten, we were told to just put him where he would be comfortable. Don't stress him out by trying to teach him. When we pushed for him to attend his neighborhood school with his sisters, we were told, just go home and let us do what we do. When I inquired about functional learning, I was told, this is all you get, like it or not. Well, I did not like it. One size did not fit all. So I helped fight to pass legislation in Ohio for a special needs scholarship so that all students could choose the right program for their needs. I worked to start a new functional learning program at our local private school. Finally, Samuel had an appropriate place to learn. Last December, Samuel was invited to the White House to meet our president and share his thoughts on education freedom. He said, school choice helped my dreams come true. My school taught me the way I learn best. I was able to fit in. I made many friends. I became a part of my community. My teachers helped me become the best I can be. President Trump shook my hand and said, wonderful job, mom. Your son is amazing. Unlike the doctor who told me to end Samuel's life before it even began, President Trump did not dismiss my son. He showed Samuel he valued him and was proud of what he accomplished. President Trump gave Samuel an equal seat at the table. 
tonight, I would like to extend my thanks to President Trump and his administration for their work towards making every student's dream of a meaningful education a reality and for fighting to ensure every child in America has an equal seat at the table of education freedom and an equal opportunity in life. Thank you, and may God bless America. It all started at a tea party. 13 years before the American Civil War, civil unrest and division separated countrymen into two opposing camps. One determined to keep African American people enslaved. The other determined to see all people free. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott felt the call to fight for that freedom when they were selected as delegates for an anti-slavery convention. But upon arrival, were told they could not speak or vote at the male-dominated event. On July 9, 1848, Mott, Stanton, and three other women met for tea. By the end of the day, they'd formed a coalition with the sole purpose of gaining the right for women to vote, so they in turn would be free to fight for the freedoms of others. Women across America united and formed activist groups working tirelessly to win the vote for American women. The unconquerable Susan B. Anthony became one of the most visible leaders of women's suffrage when, in 1872, she registered and voted for every Republican on the ballot. As punishment for her actions, she was arrested for illegal voting. At the request of Susan B. Anthony, Senator A.A. A. Sargent introduced the 19th Amendment in 1872. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment was submitted and defeated four times, but women continued to fight. Sojourner Truth and many other black suffragettes defied segregation, fighting for all women's voices to be heard and allowed to vote. For the two years prior to ratification, the silent sentinels quietly picketed the White House. Finally, when Republicans regained control of Congress. On August 26, 1920, the Equal Suffrage Amendment was signed into law. Women's suffrage movement took 72 years and would change the lives of women forever. The victory was achieved peacefully through the valiant efforts of women patriots and the democratic process. 100 years later, in a bold declaration of rights for women, President Trump granted a full pardon to Susan B. Anthony on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment's ratification. Women's suffrage was born from a desire to fight for the freedom of others. Now, we, the great patriots of America, will band together once again, and with one unified voice, we will vote for freedom. I'm Kaylee McEnany. You may know me as a supporter of President Trump, but tonight I'm here to share with you how he supported me, both as a new mom and as an American with a pre-existing condition. When I was 21 years old, I got a call that changed my life. It was my doctor informing me that I had tested positive for the BRCA2 genetic mutation, a mutation that put my chances of breast cancer at 84%. It was the same mutation that my mom had, compelling her to get a preventative double mastectomy, removing her breast tissue, but protecting her from a disease that has taken far too many of our mothers, our sisters, our friends. In my family, eight women alone were diagnosed with breast cancer, several in their young 20s. I now faced the same prospect. For nearly a decade, I was routinely at Moffitt Cancer Center, getting MRIs, ultrasounds, and necessary surveillance. During these visits, I crossed paths with brave women battling cancer and fighting through chemotherapy. They were a testament to American strength. They are American heroes. On May 1st, 
2018, I followed in my mother's footsteps, choosing to get a preventative mastectomy. I was scared. The night before, I fought back tears as I prepared to lose a piece of myself forever. But the next day, with my mom, dad, husband, and Jesus Christ by my side, I underwent a mastectomy, almost eliminating my chance of breast cancer, a decision I now celebrate. Breast reconstruction has advanced remarkably. While it is an individual's decision, my doctor and I chose a course of surgery that left me virtually unchanged. But more important than physical results, I developed a strength and a confidence that I carry with me. During one of my most difficult times, I expected to have the support of my family, but I had more support than I knew. As I came out of anesthesia, one of the first calls I received was from Ivanka Trump. As I recovered, my phone rang again. It was President Trump calling to check on me. I was blown away. Here was the leader of the free world caring about my circumstance. At the time, I had only met President Trump on a few occasions, but now I know him well, and I can tell you that this president stands by Americans with pre-existing conditions. In fact, President Trump called me this morning, I spoke with him several times today, and he told me how proud he was of me for sharing this story. The same way President Trump has supported me, he supports you. I see it every day. I've heard him say the hardest part of his job is writing to loved ones of fallen soldiers. I've seen him offer heartfelt outreach to grieving parents who lost their children to crime in the streets. And I've watched him fight for Americans who lost their jobs. President Trump fights for the American people because he cares about stories like these. I have a nine-month-old daughter. She's a beautiful, sweet little girl. And I choose to work for this president for her. When I look into my baby's eyes, I see a new life, a miracle for which I have a solemn responsibility to protect. That means protecting America's future, a future President Trump will fight for, where our neighborhoods are protected, where life is sacred, where God is cherished, not taken out of our schools, removed from our pledge, and erased from our history. I want my daughter to grow up in President Donald J. Trump's America. Choosing to have a preventative mastectomy was the hardest decision I ever had to make. But supporting President Trump, who will protect my daughter and our children's future, was the easiest. Good evening. I'm Karen Pence. My husband is Vice President Mike Pence. 100 years ago today, the 19th Amendment was adopted into the United States Constitution, guaranteeing women the right to vote. Because of heroes like Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone, women today, like our daughters, Audrey and Charlotte, and future generations, will have their voices heard and their votes count. The women's suffrage movement was the gateway that led to women having the opportunities to achieve monumental milestones and accomplish significant achievements in both civic and governmental roles. This evening, we look at heroes in our land. As second lady of the United States for the past three and a half years, I have had the honor of meeting many heroes across this great country. The Pences are a military family. 
Our son Michael serves in the United States Marines, and our son-in-law Henry serves in the U.S. Navy. And one of my key initiatives is to elevate and encourage military spouses. These men and women, like our daughter Charlotte and our daughter-in-law Sarah, are the home front heroes. I have been privileged to hear so many stories of selfless support, volunteer spirit, and great contributions to the armed forces and our communities. You know, military spouses may experience frequent moves and job changes, periods of being a single parent while their loved one is deployed, all while exhibiting pride, strength, and determination and being a part of something bigger than themselves. To all of the military spouses, thank you. President Trump and Vice President Pence have been supporting our United States Armed Forces, including our military families, on a significant scale. While traveling throughout our nation to educate military spouses about policy solutions that President Trump has promoted involving real, tangible progress in military spouse employment, I have been inspired to meet heroes like Lisa Bradley and Cameron Cruz. These military spouses decided to start their own business, R. Riveter, named after the Rosie the Riveter campaign used to recruit women workers during World War II. R. Riveter makes beautiful handbags designed and manufactured exclusively by military spouses. And many of those spouses live all over the country. They prepare and send their section of the bags to the company located in North Carolina where the final product is assembled. Military spouse hero Jalan Hall Johnson in Billings, Montana, is a culinary artist who had dreamed of starting her own restaurant. Working with the Small Business Administration's Development Center, Jalan started her restaurant, The Sassy Biscuit, and she just opened a second restaurant in Dover, New Hampshire. And as the second lady, I've also been able to bring awareness to a form of therapy for our heroic veterans suffering from PTSD. Art therapy, facilitated by a professional art therapist, is especially effective with post-traumatic stress disorder. Master Gunnery Sergeant Chris Stowe, a Marine veteran I met in Tampa, who deployed for combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, said nothing had helped him deal with the trauma from his service in the Marines until he finally agreed to meet with the art therapist at Walter Reed Medical Center. Chris credits art therapy with saving his marriage and his life. And Chris went on to establish a glass blowing workshop to help other vets. Many of our veteran heroes struggle as they transition back into civilian life, and sometimes the stress is too difficult to manage alone. A few weeks ago, I had the honor of speaking with some amazing Americans who answer the Veterans Crisis Line. One in particular, Sydney Morgan, especially impacted me. A veteran herself, Sydney said it is the highest honor of her life until they physically walk into a clinic to receive help they deserve and she can pass their hand to someone ready to help. In these difficult times, we've all seen so many examples of everyday Americans reaching out a hand to those in need, those who in humility, have considered others more important than themselves. We've seen healthcare workers, teachers, first responders, mental health providers, law enforcement officers, grocery and delivery workers, and farmers, and so many others, heroes all. 100 years ago, women secured the right to vote. So let's vote, America. Let's honor our heroes. Let's reelect President Trump and Vice President Pence for four more years. God bless our heroes and God bless the United States of America.
believe these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Good evening, I'm Kellyanne Conway. 100 years ago, courageous warriors helped women secure the right to vote. This has been a century worth celebrating, but also a reminder that our democracy is young and fragile. A woman in a leadership role can still seem novel. Not so for President Trump. For decades, he has elevated women to senior positions in business and in government. He confides in and consults us, respects our opinions, and insists that we are on equal footing with the men. President Trump helped me shatter a barrier in the world of politics by empowering me to manage his campaign to its successful conclusion. With the help of millions of Americans, our team defied the critics, the naysayers, the conventional wisdom, and we won. For many of us, women's empowerment is not a slogan. It comes not from strangers on social media or sanitized language in a corporate handbook. It comes from the everyday heroes who nurture us, who shape us, and who believe in us. I was raised in a household of all women. They were self-reliant and resilient. Their lives were not easy, but they never complained. Money was tight, but we had an abundance of what mattered most, family, faith, and freedom. I learned that in America, limited means does not make for limited dreams. The promise of America belongs to us all. This is a land of inventors and innovators, of entrepreneurs and educators, of pioneers and parents, each contributing to the success and the future of a great nation and her people. These everyday heroes have a champion in President Trump. The teacher who took extra time to help students adjust to months of virtual learning. The nurse who finished a 12-hour COVID shift and then took a brief break only to change her mask, gown, and gloves to do it all over again. The small business owner striving to reopen after the lockdown was lifted and then again after her store was vandalized and looted. The single mom with two kids, two jobs, two commutes, who 10 years after that empty promise finally has health insurance. President Trump and Vice President Pence have lifted Americans, provided them with dignity, opportunity, and results. I have seen firsthand many times the president comforting and encouraging a child who has lost a parent, a parent who has lost a child, a worker who lost his job, an adolescent who lost her way to drugs. Don't lose hope, he has told them, assuring them that they are not alone and that they matter. There always will be people who have far more than us, our responsibility is to focus on those who have far less than us. President Trump has done precisely that in taking unprecedented action to combat this nation's drug crisis. He told me, this is so important, Kellyanne. So many lives have been ruined by addiction and will never even know it because people are ashamed to reach out for help and they're not even sure who to turn to in their toughest hour. Rather than look the other way, President Trump stared directly at this drug crisis next door and through landmark bipartisan legislation has helped secure historic investments in surveillance, interdiction, education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. We have a long way to go, but the political inertia that costs lives and the silence and the stigma that prevents people in need from coming forward is melting away. This is the man I know and the president we need for four more years. He picks the toughest fights 
and tackles the most complex problems. He has stood by me and he will stand up for you. In honor of the women who empowered me and for the future of the children we all cherish, thank you and God bless you always. Good evening. I'm Sister Dee Dee Byrne, and I belong to the community of the little workers of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. Last 4th of July, I was honored to be one of the President's guests at his Salute to America celebration. I must confess that I recently prayed while in chapel, begging God to allow me to be a voice and instrument for human life. And now here I am, speaking at the Republican National Convention. I guess you better be careful for what you pray for. My journey to religious life was not a traditional route, if there is such a thing. In 1978, as a medical stu school student at Georgetown University, I joined the Army to help pay for my tuition and ended up devoting 29 years to the military, serving as a doctor and a surgeon in places like Afghanistan and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. After much prayer and contemplation, I entered my religious order in 2002, working to serve the poor and the sick in Haiti, Sudan, Kenya, Iraq, and in Washington, D.C. Humility is at the foundation of our order, which makes it very difficult to talk about myself. But I can speak about my experience working for those fleeing war-torn and impoverished countries all around the world. Those refugees all share a common experience. They have been all marginalized, viewed as insignificant, powerless, and voiceless. And while we tend to think of the marginalized as living beyond our borders, the truth is the largest marginalized group in the world can be found here in the United States. They are the unborn. As Christians, we first met Jesus as a stirring embryo in the womb of an unwed mother and saw him born nine months later in the poverty of the cave. It's no coincidence that Jesus stood up for what was just and was un ultimately crucified because what he said wasn't politically correct or fashionable. As followers of Christ, we are called to stand up for life against the politically correct or fashionable of today. We must fight against a legislative agenda that supports and even celebrates destroying life in the womb. Keep in mind the laws we create define how we see our humanity. And we must ask ourselves, what are we saying when we go into a womb and snuff out an innocent, powerless, voiceless life? As a physician, I can say without hesitation, life begins at conception. While what I have to say may be difficult for some to hear, I am saying it because I'm not just pro-life, I'm pro-eternal life, and I want all of us to end up in heaven together someday. Which brings me to why I'm here today. Donald Trump is the most pro-life president that this nation has ever had, defending life at all stages. His belief in the sanctity of life transcends politics. President Trump will stand up against Biden-Harris, who are the most anti-life presidential ticket ever, even supporting the horrors of late-term abortion and infanticide. Because of his courage and conviction, President Trump has earned the support of America's pro-life community. Moreover, he has a nationwide of religious standing behind him. You'll find us here with our weapon of choice, the rosary. So thank you, Mr. President. We are all praying for you. I'm Lou Holtz. Many of you might know me as Coach Holtz, or maybe that football guy. It is a pleasure, a blessing, and an honor for me to explain why I believe that President Trump is a consistent winner, an outstanding leader, and deserves to be reelected as our president. First, I want you to know that I grew up in a one-bedroom house in West Virginia. I may have been poor, 
but the lessons my parents taught me were priceless. They taught me that life is about making choices. Wherever you are, good or bad, don't blame anyone else. Go get an education, get to work. You can overcome any obstacles. And always remember that in this great country of ours, anyone can amount to something special. I lived by those principles of hard work and responsibility my whole life, living out the American story, and it works. But there are people today, like politicians, professors, protesters, and of course, President Trump's naysayers in the media who like to blame others for problems. They don't have pride in our country, and because they no longer ask, what can I do for my country? Only what the country should be doing for them. They don't have pride in themselves. That's wrong. When I was an officer in the Army, I served with so many great Americans who embraced their responsibility to our country. I'm so proud of their sacrifices and the opportunity it has provided for so many millions. America remains a land of opportunity. No matter what the other side says, or believes. You know, there's a statue of me at Notre Dame. I guess they needed a place for the pigeons to land. But if you look closely, you will see these three words there, trust, commitment, and love. All my life, I've made my choices based on these three words. I use these three rules to make choices about everything. My beloved wife of 59 years, athletes I coached, and of course, politicians, even President Trump. I ask myself three things. One, can I trust them? When a leader tells you something, you got to be able to count on it. That's President Trump. He says what he means, he means what he says. And he's done what he said he would do at every single turn. One of the important reasons he has my trust is because nobody has been a stronger advocate for the unborn than President Trump. The Biden-Harris ticket is the most radically pro-abortion campaign in history. They and other politicians are Catholics in name only and abandon innocent lives. President Trump protects those lives. I trust President Trump. The second question I ask is, are they committed to doing their very best? President Trump always finds a way to get something done. If you want to do something bad enough, you will find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And excuses are a lot easier to find than solutions. President Trump finds solutions. President Trump is committed. And the third question I ask is, do they love people? Do they care about others? To me, this is very clear. President Trump has demonstrated through his prison reform, advocating for school choice and welfare reform, that he wants Americans from all walks of life to have the opportunity to succeed and live the American dream. President Trump loves our country and our great people. Trust, commitment, and love. In President Trump, we have a president we can trust who works hard at making America greater, and who genuinely cares about people. If I apply this test to Joe Biden, I can't say yes to any of these three questions. I used to ask our athletes at Notre Dame, if you did not show up, who would miss you and why? Can you imagine what would happen to us if President Trump had not shown up in 2016 to run for president? I'm so glad he showed up. Thank you for showing up, Mr. President. I encourage everyone who loves this country, who loves America, to show up in November for President Trump. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael McHale, but my friends call me Mick. I'm a 30-year active duty member of law enforcement in the state of Florida. I am also the president of the National Association of Police Organizations, NAPO. 
Our organization recently endorsed Donald Trump for re-election as President of the United States. Our endorsement recognized his strong support for the men and women on the front lines, particularly during these challenging times. We value his support of aggressive federal prosecution of those who attack our police officers. His signing of the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Act and his support for permanently authorizing funds to support 9-11 first responders and their families. Law enforcement officers across the nation take an oath to run towards danger when everyone else is running away. They do so willingly to protect our families and communities. I'm proud that the overwhelming majority of American police officers are the best of the best and put their lives on the line without hesitation. And good officers need to know their elected leaders and the department brass have their backs. Unfortunately, chaos results when failed officials in cities like Portland, Minneapolis, Chicago, and New York make the conscious decision not to support law enforcement. Shootings, murders, looting, and rioting occur unabated. The violence and bloodshed we are seeing in these and other cities isn't happening by chance. It's the direct result of refusing to allow law enforcement to protect our communities. Joe Biden has turned his candidacy over to the far left anti-law enforcement radicals. And as a senator, Kamala Harris pushed to further restrict police cut their training, and make our American communities and streets even more dangerous than they already are. Conversely, President Trump supports the creation of a national standard for training on de-escalation and communication to give officers more tools to resolve conflict without violence. The differences between Trump, Pence, and Biden-Harris are crystal clear. Your choices are the most pro-law enforcement president we've ever had, or the most radical anti-police ticket in history. We invite those who value the safety of their family and loved ones to join the hundreds of thousands of members of the National Association of Police Organizations and support the re-election of President Donald J. Trump. Thank you, and God bless America. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, and I am honored to represent New York's 21st Congressional District, the cradle of the American Revolution. It's where almost 250 years ago, brave patriots fought in the battles of Saratoga to turn the tide of the Revolutionary War. It's where 40 years ago in Lake Placid, a team of amateur hockey players out-hustled, out-skated, and defeated the Soviet Union, stunning the world and giving us the unforgettable miracle on ice. And today, it's home to Fort Drum and the historic 10th Mountain Division, the most deployed unit in the U.S. Army me since 9-11, where I saw firsthand President Trump graciously thank and honor our men and women in uniform and sign the largest pay raise for our troops in a decade. Since our nation's founding, generation after generation of everyday Americans served and sacrificed to preserve and strengthen the American dream, the vision of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the idea that if you work hard and dream big, you can achieve anything you imagine. I believe in the American dream because I've lived it. Like millions of Americans, I grew up in a small business family where I learned the values of hard work and determination. 
I was the first person in my immediate family to graduate from college, ran for Congress to serve upstate New York, and am proudly the youngest Republican woman elected to Congress in history. I am honored to support President Trump for re-election because I know that he is the only candidate who will stand up for hardworking families and protect the American dream for future generations. Since his first day in office, President Trump has fought tirelessly to deliver results for all Americans, despite the Democrats' baseless and illegal impeachment sham and the media's endless obsession with it. I was proud to lead the effort standing up for the Constitution, President Trump, and most importantly, the American people. This attack was not just on the president. It was an attack on you, your voice and your vote. But the American people were not swayed by these partisan attacks. Our support for President Trump is stronger than ever before. We know what's at stake in this historic election. Americans from all walks of life are unified in support of our president. It's why more Republican women than ever are running for office this year. We understand that this election is a choice between the far-left Democratic Socialist agenda versus protecting and preserving the American dream. President Trump is working to safely reopen our Main Street economy. He understands that the engine of our country is fueled by the ingenuity and determination of American workers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses. Joe Biden wants to keep them locked up in the basement and crush them with $4 trillion in new taxes. We face a critical choice. Joe Biden's far-left failed policies of the past 47 years, or President Trump, who will stand up for the American people and the Constitution. I believe in the wisdom and spirit of the American people to elect the only candidate who is capable of protecting the American dream, President Donald J. Trump. Thank you to the North Country for the opportunity to serve as your voice, supporting his reelection. God bless the United States of America, the greatest country on earth. Good evening. I'm Madison Crawford, and I'm running to represent North Carolina's 11th Congressional District. This is a time of great adversity for our country. And I know something about adversity. At 18 years old, I was in a horrific car accident that's left me paralyzed from the waist down. Instantly, my hopes and dreams were seemingly destroyed. I was given a 1% chance of surviving. But thanks to the power of prayer, a very loving community and many skilled doctors, I made it. It took me over a year to recover. My first public outing in a wheelchair was to a professional baseball game. You know, before my accident, I was six foot three. I stood out in a crowd. But as I wheeled through the stadium, I felt invisible. At 20, I thought about giving up. However, I knew I could still make a difference. You know, my accident has given me new eyes to see and new ears to hear. God protected my mind and my ability to speak. So I say to people who feel forgotten, ignored and invisible, I see you. I hear you. At 20, I made a choice. In 2020, our country has a choice. We can give up on the American idea or we can work together to make our imperfect union more perfect. I choose to fight for the future, to seize the high ground and retake the shining city on a hill. While the radical left wants to dismantle, defund and destroy, Republicans under President Trump's leadership want to rebuild restore and renew. I just turned 25. When I'm elected this November, I'll be the youngest member of Congress in over 200 years. And if you don't think young people can change the world, then you just don't know American history. George Washington was 21 when he received his first military commission. Abe Lincoln, 22 when he first ran for office. And my personal favorite, James Madison, was just 25 years old when he signed the Declaration of Independence. In times of peril, young people have stepped up and saved this country, abroad and at home. We held the line, scaled the cliffs, 
crossed oceans, liberated camps, and cracked codes. Yet today, political forces want to usher in the digital dark ages, a time of information without wisdom and tribalism without truth. National leaders on the left have normalized emotion-based voting and a radicalized identity politics that rejects Martin Luther King's dream. MLK's dream is our dream for all Americans to be judged solely on their character. Millions of people risk their lives every year to come here because they believe in the dream of MLK and the American dream. Join us as we, the party of freedom, double down on ensuring the American dream for all people. We are committed to building a new town square. It welcomes all ideas and all people. Here we will have freedom of speech, not freedom from speech. To liberals, I say let's have a conversation. Be a true liberal. Listen to other ideas and let the best ones prevail. And to conservatives, I say let's define what we support and win the argument in areas like health care, on the environment. In this new town square, you don't have to apologize for your beliefs or cower to a mob. You can kneel before God, but stand for our flag. The American idea my ancestors fought for during the Revolutionary War is just as exciting and revolutionary today as it was 250 years ago. I say to Americans who love our country, young and old, be a radical for freedom, be a radical for liberty, and be a radical for our republic, for which I stand, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and may God bless America. I'm Jack Brewer, a former three-time NFL team captain, college professor, coach, husband, son, and father. I'm also a lifelong Democrat, but I support Donald Trump. Let me be clear, I didn't come here for the popularity or the praise, the likes or the retweets. I'm here as a servant to God, a servant to the people of our nation, and a servant to our president. I grew up in Grayvon, Texas a town that my great-grandfather was the first black man to settle as a sharecropper in 1896. My early high school experience included fighting with skinheads and being in witness in an attempted murder trial after my friend shot a skinhead in self-defense. I remember my dad's bravery when he personally stood up against a KKK rally in my town. In my house, my father taught me to back down from no one. I know what racism looks like. I've seen it firsthand. In America, it has no resemblance to President Trump. And I'm fed up with the way he's portrayed in the media, who refuse to acknowledge what he's actually done for the black community. It's confusing the minds of our innocent children. Before I left to come deliver this message, my energetic eight-year-old son Jackson stopped me and said, Dad, can you please just tell everyone that all lives need to matter? and that God loves everyone. In that moment, I realized that my eight-year-old had figured out what so many adults have seemed to forget. We are not as divided as our politics suggest. At some point, for the sake of our children, the policies must take priority over the personalities. So because you have an issue with President Trump's tone, you're going to allow Biden and Harris to, de to deny our underserved black and brown children school choice? Are we so offended by the president's campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, that we're going to ignore that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have collectively been responsible for locking up countless black men for nonviolent crimes? Are you going to allow the media to lie to you? by falsely claiming that he said there were very fine white supremacists in Charlottesville? He didn't say that. It's a lie. And ignore the so-called Black Lives Matter organization that openly, on their website, calls for the destruction of the nuclear family. My fellow Americans, our families need each other. We need black fathers in the homes with their wives and children. 
The future of our communities depend on it. I'm blessed to be able to run inner city youth programs and to also teach in prisons across America. The inmates in my federal prison program literally receive days off their sentence just for attending my class. And that's thanks to President Donald Trump and his first step back. President Trump cared about these Americans and their families, even when so many others had left them behind and had written them off. I'm forever grateful for President Trump for that. He endures relentless attacks, and so do many of us, like myself, who support him. But my mom always told me, when the Lord starts blessing, the devil starts messing. This convention marks a time to celebrate our history. Republicans are the party that freed the slaves and the party that put the first black men and women in Congress. It's the party of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. And now, Tim Scott and Donald Trump. Our president has made incredible strides to end mass incarceration and give unprecedented opportunities for black in America to rise. America, let this election be a call for all God's people who are called by his name to humble ourselves and pray together and to seek his face and to turn from our wicked ways then he will hear us from heaven, and he will forgive our sins, and he will heal our land. Amen, and God bless America. Greetings. My name is Chen Guancheng. Standing up to tyranny is not easy, I know. When I spoke out against China's one child policy and other injustices, I was prosecuted, beaten, sent to prison, and put under house arrest by the Chinese Communist Party the CCP. In April 2005, 2012, I escaped and was given shelter in the American Embassy in Beijing. I'm forever grateful to the American people for welcoming me and my family to the United States, where we are now free. The CCP is an enemy of humanity. It is terrorizing its own people, and it is threatening the well-being of the world. In China, expressing beliefs or ideas not approved by the CCP Religion, democracy, human rights can lead to prison. The nation lives under mass surveillance and censorship. The U.S. must use its values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law to gather a coalition of other democracies to stop CCP's aggression. President Trump had led on this, and we need the other countries to join him in this fight, a fight for our future. Standing up to fight unfairness isn't easy, I know. So does President Trump, but he has shown the courage to wage that fight. We need to support, vote, and fight for President Trump for the sake of the world. Thank you. Congressman Lee Zeldin. Tonight, 
as we celebrate America as a land of heroes. I'm here at a VFW post of heroes in West Hampton Beach, New York. I've seen amazing Americans in action, raised in a law enforcement family, deployed to Iraq as an 82nd Airborne Paratrooper, and serving today in the Army Reserve. My generation of post 9-11 veterans has huge shoes to fill, following our greatest generation that fought tyranny and saved the world. All over our country, everyday heroes serve and sacrifice for the greater good. Farmers, truckers, craftsmen, these heroes keep America running, and President Trump fights for them every day. This year, we've especially relied on one particular group of heroes, frontline medical workers. My twin daughters, Michaela and Ariana, were born over 14 weeks early. They weighed just a pound and a half. At two weeks, Michaela went into septic shock, had a stroke, and underwent brain surgery, leaving a third of the left side of her brain a hole. Her doctors didn't believe Michaela would survive, fearing dire permanent consequences even if she did. Through the miracles of modern medicine, power of prayer, and her will to live, my daughters are now starting high school and doing great with no long-term effects from those frightful months in the NICU. So when I learned my county's PPE stockpile was depleted, I immediately thought of those healthcare workers who saved my baby girls. Jared Kushner and I were on the phone late into that Saturday night. The very next day, President Trump announced he was sending us 200,000 N95 masks. He actually delivered almost 400,000. That number quickly grew to 1.2 million, masks, gowns, and more. The president sent thousands of ventilators to New York. He deployed the USS Comfort and converted the Javits Center to a field hospital. His administration authorized our lab testing requests at blinding speed. During a once-in-a-century pandemic, an unforeseeable crisis sent to us from a faraway land, the president's effort for New York was phenomenal. For our nation to emerge even stronger, more prosperous, freer, and more secure than ever, to make our country greater than ever before, we must reelect President Trump. We are the land of the free because of the brave. And we are the land of opportunity because we have a president who wants to empower the best of who we are to be the best of what we can be. There's never been a nation greater than ours, never a people more resilient than ours, and never a future for America more promising than ours right now. Keeping America great is up to us, and losing is not an option. Very proud to have President Trump in office here. Because he's the best we've ever had. He's done the most for any any president ever has done. He's always there trying to take care of veterans, giving veterans what they need. The turnaround times have increased since Trump has taken over. Take you had to fight 15 years for benefits, but once he came into office, you had like 90 days, you turned your paperwork in, at least you had some kind of answer. I waited once for a signature on a piece of paper to get a prosthetic leg fixed, and now it's a lot better turnaround. But before, it was a five-year waiting process to appeal. So I mean, how long do we have to wait for benefits? I waited 20 years to file. Rapidly was approved for medical, and then right turned right around and got disability. I was thinking it was gonna be a several years worth of waiting to hear. He's accomplished a lot in three and a half years, and it, it helps the American people, and he has done a lot for veterans, for the middle class. I chose to serve my country. If I could do it, I would do it all over again, especially for this president. I mean, he's the kind of president you'd run through a brick wall if he asked you to. Went through many presidents, but this one, I can say, is the best president we've ever had and ever will have, I believe.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me into your home this evening. It's truly a privilege. My name is Joni Ernst. I was raised on a small family farm here in Iowa, where I learned the importance of faith, hard work, and service. I worked my way through college, then dedicated my life to serving my country as a local official, a battalion commander in the military, and as a U.S. Senator. Service, it's more than a word to me. It's a mission, a way of life. It's what brought me to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 2008 when I was in the National Guard. We saw historic floods that swept through the communities. We lent a helping hand to our fellow Iowans who were literally underwater. We thought we had seen the worst, but 12 years later, these same communities have faced an even more devastating disaster, the recent derecho storm. If you don't live in Iowa, you may not have heard much about it at first. While reporters here in the state were in the trenches covering the equivalent of a Category 2 hurricane, most of the national media looked the other way. To them, Iowa is still just fly over country. Houses, farms were destroyed. About one third of our crops here were damaged. In some cases, these storms wiped out a lifetime of work. And yet Iowa farmers didn't hesitate to grab their chainsaws and check on their neighbors. Our farmers live every day with that sense of service, the stewards of the land, the ones who feed and fuel the world. President Trump quickly signed an emergency declaration for Iowa to provide relief. And of course, when President Trump came to Cedar Rapids, the national media finally did too. For years, I've worked closely with the president for farmers in Iowa and across the country. We scrapped Obama and Biden's punishing waters of the United States rule, which would have regulated about 97% of land in Iowa, in some cases, even puddles. It would have been a nightmare for farmers. The president delivered on major trade deals with Japan and the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. And he implemented the sale of E15 fuel year round. That means more choices for you at the pump and more jobs for farmers in the heartland. This is something the Obama-Biden administration failed to do in eight years. In fact, I can't recall an administration more hostile to farmers than Obama-Biden, unless you count the Biden-Harris ticket. The Democratic Party of Joe Biden is pushing this so-called Green New Deal. If given power, they would essentially ban animal agriculture and eliminate gas-powered cars. It would destroy the agriculture industry, not just here in Iowa, but throughout the country. When the pandemic hit, President Trump heard us in our call for assistance for our farmers. Knowing we have an ally in the White House is important. Folks, this election is a choice between two very different paths, freedom, prosperity, and economic growth under a Trump-Pence administration, or the Biden-Harris path, paved by liberal coastal elites and radical environmentalists, an America where farmers are punished, jobs are destroyed, and taxes crush the middle class. That is our choice and it's a clear one. Thank you, and God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Burgess Owens. Shackled in the belly of a slave ship, an eight-year-old boy named Silas Burgess came to America to be sold on an auction block. By the grace of God and the courage of slaves who believed in freedom, Silas escaped through the Underground Railroad and settled in the great state of Texas he went on to become a successful entrepreneur. He built his community's first church, first elementary school, and purchased 102 acres of farmland, which he paid off in two years. I'm here today, a candidate for Congress, because of my great-great-grandfather, Silas Burgess. I was raised in the South during the days of Jim Crow and the KKK. Even through the challenges of segregation, we were taught that anything is possible in America. When I was 22 years old, I thought all my dreams had come true when I was drafted by the New York Jets. 
Ten years later, with a Pro Bowl nod and a Super Bowl championship under my belt, I left the NFL to start a business. I thought I could never fail, but years later I did, and I lost everything. As I moved my family of six into a one-bedroom basement apartment in Brooklyn, New York, I had a choice to make, to feel sorry for myself or get to work. I worked as a chimney sweep during the day and a security guard at night. It was humbling to be recognized. From NBC News, the Republican National Convention, here are Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie. Good evening, everyone. The third night of the Republican Convention is underway against a backdrop of several major stories that touch on issues that could impact this election. That's right. There's a big weather story unfolding at this hour. Hurricane Laura, now a Category 4 storm, just hours away from landfall on the Gulf Coast. And the community of Kenosha, Wisconsin, on edge again tonight. A curfew in effect there. And the National Guard called out after the shooting of a black man led to protests and violence there. And the protests have now reached the world of sports tonight. The NBA's three playoff games suspended, as well as three Major League Baseball games postponed for the night. And a rising death toll in the COVID pandemic. Today, passing 180,000 deaths in this country, according to the latest count by NBC News. We're likely to hear more about these topics tonight. And our team of correspondents will dig into how all these issues could shape this election. So the convention's been underway tonight for about 90 minutes. We've heard from several White House staffers in the last hour. And we are waiting any moment now. Laura Trump, the daughter-in-law of President Trump. But the main event, Vice President Pence, Chief White House Correspondent Hallie Jackson is at Fort McHenry, where the Vice President will be speaking in a few. Hallie, what are we expecting? Savannah, you talked about all the news that's happening as we come on the air tonight. The vice president is, of course, aware of all of that. And I just spoke with a source familiar with the vice president's speech who said even late into tonight, tweaks were being made because of the avalanche of news. Everything from the hurricane, which I'm told the vice president is likely to address, to issues surrounding race and the police shootings that we've been talking about, which I'm told the vice president will speak broadly about. Expect this speech, though, to hit heavily on themes of patriotism. When you keep in mind the setting, we are here here at Fort McHenry, the site that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner. And the vice president would also talk policy. He will, according to sources, really try to draw contrast and be more policy heavy than we've seen with previous speakers and talk about the perils of a Joe Biden administration from that policy perspective. We've seen several staff members of the administration, as you referenced, including many who talked about their experience as a woman working with Donald Trump. And that is a theme we're going to hear as well when Laura Trump takes the stage. I'm told by a source familiar with her speech that she'll share her personal stories about joining the Trump family and getting to know a different side of President Trump. Savannah? Well, we're just moments away from that, and women have definitely been a theme yeah. of the night with Karen Pence, the second lady of the United States, talking, several staffers really vouching for his personal character. Let's quickly turn to Andrea Mitchell on this. Seems like it, it on the anniversary of, of women's suffrage, it's ladies' night at the Republican yes. convention. And it actually has been something of a great focus for several nights now, certainly tonight. And Laura Trump is a great example. She married into the family. She's not a Trump. She's from North Carolina. She has a working class background. She is certainly part of this appeal to the suburban women who have been abandoning uh, the president in droves. The gender gap now in our latest poll was 21 points. That is a, a gendered Grand Canyon, not just a gap. And with that, she is going to be talking about her roots in the South and as a working class person, and she will be a tough, tough speaker. And we, and we should point out, we noted the, the number of news events happening around the country right now. Some of the things you'll be seeing are on tape, some will be live, so references are going to have to be taken with that in mind. I believe Laura Trump's remarks are on tape. Uh, so we'll see what she has to say, and let's go right now to the RNC feed. Good evening, America. I'm Lara Trump, daughter of Bob and Linda Unaska, sister to Kyle, mother to Luke and Carolina, and the daughter-in-law of our 45th president, Donald J. Trump. But tonight, I come to you simply as an American. My life began like many in our country. I grew up in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. My parents were small business owners and worked hard to make sure that my brother and I had everything we needed, but not everything we wanted. My parents raised me to believe that in America, I could achieve anything with hard work and determination, that the opportunities available to me were limited only by the size of my ambition. 
that I should dream big, and I did. Those very dreams are what led me to New York City. I'd heard the adage, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere, and I intended to do just that. Never in a million years did I think that I would be on this stage tonight, and I certainly never thought that I'd end up with the last name Trump. My seventh grade English teacher, Mrs. B, used to tell us, believe none of what you hear, half of what you read, and only what you're there to witness firsthand. The meaning of those words never fully weighed on me until I met my husband and the Trump family. Any preconceived notion I had of this family disappeared immediately. They were warm and caring. They were hard workers, and they were down to earth. They reminded me of my own family. They made me feel like I was home. Walking the halls of the Trump Organization, I saw the same family environment. I also saw the countless women executives who thrived there year after year. Gender didn't matter. What mattered was the ability to get the job done. I learned this directly when, in 2016, my father-in-law asked me to help him win my cherished home state and my daughter's namesake, North Carolina. Though I had no political experience, he believed in me. He knew I was capable, even if I didn't. So it didn't surprise me when President Donald Trump appointed so many women to senior level positions in his administration. Secretary of the United Nations, Secretary of the Air Force, the first female CIA director, the first black female director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and countless ambassadors, just to name a few. Under President Trump's leadership, women's unemployment hit the lowest level since World War II. 4.3 million new jobs have been created for women. In 2019 alone, women took over 70 percent of all new jobs. Female small business ownership remains at an all-time high, and 600,000 women have been lifted out of poverty, all since President Trump took office. He didn't do these things to gain a vote or check a box. He did them because they're the right things to do. 100 years ago today, the 19th Amendment was ratified, granting the right to vote to every American woman. And since that day, incredible strides have been made by women in America. From Amelia Earhart to Rosa Parks and Sally Ride, women shaped our history and are part of what has made our country the most exceptional nation in the world. I often think back to my 24-year-old self, driving alone in my car from North Carolina to New York City. And I think about what I'd tell myself now as we head towards the most critical election in modern history. This is not just a choice between Republican and Democrat, or left and right. This is an election that will decide if we keep America, America, or if we head down an uncharted, frightening path towards socialism. Abraham Lincoln once famously said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. While those words were spoken over 150 years ago, never have they been more relevant. Will we choose the right path and maintain the unique freedoms and boundless opportunities that make this country the greatest in the history of the world? Will we remain the beacon of hope for those around the world fighting oppression, communism, and tyranny? The choice is ours. I know the promise of America because I've lived it, not just as a member of the Trump family, but as a woman who knows what it's like to work in blue-collar jobs, to serve customers for tips, and to aspire to rise. When I look at my son Luke and my daughter Carolina, I wonder, what sort of country will I be leaving for them? for our future generations. In recent months, we've seen weak, spineless politicians seek control of our great American cities to violent mobs. Defund the police is the rallying cry for the new radical Democrat Party. Joe Biden will not do what it takes to maintain order, to keep our children safe in our neighborhoods and in their schools, to restore our American way of life. We cannot dare to dream our biggest dreams for ourselves or for our children while consumed by worry about the safety of our families. President Trump is the law and order president, from our borders to our backyards. President Trump will keep America safe. President Trump will keep America prosperous. President Trump will keep America, America. 
If you're watching tonight and wrestling with your vote on November 3rd, I implore you, tune out the distorted news and biased commentary and hear it straight from someone who knows. I wasn't born a Trump. I'm from the South. I was raised a Carolina girl. I went to public schools and worked my way through a state university. Mrs. B from my seventh grade English class was right. What I learned about our president is different than what you might have heard. I learned that he's a good man, that he loves his family, that he didn't need this job, that no one on earth works harder for the American people, that he's willing to fight for his beliefs and for the people and the country that he loves. He is a person of conviction. He is a fighter and will never stop fighting for America. He will uphold our values. He will preserve our families. And he will build upon the great American edict that our union will never be perfect until opportunity is equal for all, including and especially for women. Our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, said it best. The dreams of people may differ, but everybody wants their dreams to come true. And America, above all places, gives us the freedom to do that. It's up to us to keep this country a place where no dream is out of reach for our children and generations beyond. To my father-in-law, thank you for believing in me. Thank you for bravely leading this country and thank you for continuing to fight every day for America. May God bless and protect the Gulf states in the path of the hurricane. May God bless our troops and may God continue to bless this incredible country. Laura Trump concluding her remarks, the uh, daughter-in-law of the president, also a, uh, a campaign advisor. As we said on the outset, there's a lot going on tonight that's reverberating in the convention. You heard her mention of the hurricane. There's also fallout from the shooting on Sunday of a black man, Jacob Blake, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It has triggered the same grief and outrage we saw after the killing of George Floyd three months ago. And it's already reverberated in the world of sports. Milwaukee Bucks players boycotted a scheduled NBA playoff game in protest. That then prompted the NBA to postpone three games. There's a curfew in effect in Kenosha. The attorney general, some of the law enforcement officials spoke today for the first time, giving more information about what happened. And we want to go to the ground there. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez in Kenosha tonight. Gabe, how is the evening looking so far? Uh, hi, Savannah. Well, you mentioned that this shooting is ricocheting across the country in the sports world. But here in Kenosha, this is a city in virtual lockdown. It has been for the last several days. Uh, this is the fourth night of protests. Right behind me, several hundred protesters are gathered once again in front of the county courthouse, ignoring a curfew. So far, things tonight have remained peaceful so far. But it's when you get deeper into the night that these protests have often turned violent. Now, Savannah, you mentioned that authorities did speak today for the first time. We really hadn't heard a lot from local authorities, but today the U.S. Department of Justice confirmed that it is opening a federal civil rights investigation into the shooting. Also, the Wisconsin State Attorney General identified the officer who shot Jacob Blake for the first time today, and he also revealed that investigators had found a knife inside of Blake's car. However, many of these protesters say that that should not make any difference. They see this as part of a long history of mistrust between police and communities of color. Of course, as you mentioned, Savannah and Lester, this comes just months after the death of George Floyd. There have been several flashpoints over the last several months, including in Portland, now here in Wisconsin, a critical swing state. And you heard Lara Trump's speech where she talked about a violent mob that President Trump would protect Americans from. He, she said that President Trump would be uh, the president that keeps American cities safe, clearly a sense part of their re-election strategy. But again, right here in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Lester and Savannah, this is another violent, uh, this is another night of protest. Last night turned violent. Two people shot and killed. And this community is wondering what's next. Savannah. All right, Gabe, thank you. And we're fortunate to have with us now tonight Eugene Robinson, Washington Post columnist and associate editor and NBC News contributor. Uh, good to have you with us. We have heard over the last couple of days in this convention talk about danger in the streets and riots in the streets and, and the future under the Democratic Party. Can you frame, can, can you frame what's happening there with what's happening on the ground where Gabe is? 
Well, there's a total disconnect, Lester. I suspect we'll hear more about violent mobs and about President Trump um, being uh, the only um, the only thing standing between the United States and anarchy. We, we we heard not a word in that Laura Trump speech about Jacob Blake. Uh, who was shot seven times in the back. Um, we have we, we, the police responding to a domestic uh, call, and he ends up shot seven times in the back and apparently paralyzed for life. We heard not a word about the two protesters who were shot apparently by a young white vigilante uh, who, who came from Illinois uh, to, to um, self-appointed to patrol the streets of Kenosha uh, and ended up killing uh, two people and, and grievously injuring one. We heard nothing about racial justice and the reckoning with, with 400 years of systemic racism uh, that majority of Americans, according to polls, are ready to undertake. Uh, are ready to talk about and grapple with. This convention is not ready to grapple with any of that. This convention is ready to frighten voters, um, hopefully Trump voters, according from their point of view, uh, into going to the polls and, and they're trying to frighten them of what they describe as anarchy and violent mobs uh, in the streets. For no given reason, we have no no idea, no context, no no sense of, of what's happening in the country. Eugene, uh, let me jump in here. I just want to point out what people are seeing on the top right of their screen is the RNC feed, and they're listening now to Clarence Henderson, who was uh, at that Woolworth lunch counter on February 2nd, 1960, protesting segregation. And he's speaking tonight as a supporter of Donald Trump. We've actually seen that. Several uh, speakers, African Americans, who've come out, some Democrats saying, I support Trump, and this is why. Um, and and we'll, we'll show you a portion of what's been said tonight and in the last couple of nights. Growing up in the deep south, I've seen racism up close. I know what it is, and it isn't Donald Trump. Just because someone loves and respects the flag, our national anthem, and our country, doesn't mean they don't care about social justice. I'm part of a large and growing segment of the black community who are independent thinkers, and we believe that Donald Trump is the president that America needs to lead us forward. I think often about my ancestors who struggled for freedom, and as I think of those giants and their broad shoulders, I also think about Joe Biden who says, if you aren't voting for me, you ain't black, who argued that Republicans would put us back in chains, who says there is no diversity of thought in the black community. I remember my dad's bravery when he personally stood up against a KKK rally in my town, in my house. My father taught me to back down from no one. I know what racism looks like. I've seen it firsthand. In America, it has no resemblance to President Trump. And I'm fed up with the way he's portrayed in the media, who refuse to acknowledge what he's actually done for the black community. Let's turn to White House correspondent Kristen Welka for more on this. This has been one of the most striking aspects of the Republican convention so far, an array of black speakers who are coming in and saying, we support Trump and the Democrats have taken you for granted all these years. Talk about the strategy here. And I'll remind our viewers that black men were the key to the, uh, the, the Hillary Clinton's loss in Michigan and Wisconsin in 2016, that they, they didn't show up in the numbers they had before. Well, that's a really important point, Savannah, and it has just been striking to hear from all of these black speakers and black men in particular. So to break down a couple of points, one, they are trying to make the case that Democrats do not own the black vote, uh, that it is still up for grabs and should not be taken for granted. They are also trying to blunt some of the criticism that President Trump has gotten, particularly against the backdrop of these nationwide protests that uh, he has has been tone deaf when it comes to what the protesters are calling for, which is racial justice and equality. And then to break down that vote that you just talked about, Savannah, black men have made up about 5% of the vote, according to exit polls, going back to 2008. And increasingly, Democrats are getting less of that share. So the strategy to try to peel away some of those votes from Joe Biden, will it work? 
We'll have to see. It is worth noting that President Trump has said that he's sending in the National Guard to Kenosha, but has not commented on that shooting that took place there yet, Savannah. All right, Kristen, thank you. It'll be curious to see if we actually hear the name Jacob Blake uh, mention as we go forward. Let's bring in NBC political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Chuck, real world events like what's happening right now have a way of disrupting the best laid political plans. What do you think so far? Well, I, I do, and I think, you know, in two weeks, you, you know, it's it's very possible we're still talking about Wisconsin, we're still talking about hurricane recovery, and we're not talking about this convention. And let's just be realistic, that, that could very well be the case. I think what's happening on the ground in Kenosha, and frankly, we know perhaps what's going to happen with this storm, is something that is, is going to linger. But, you know, there's been another thing that has been striking about this sort of attempt to sort of remake the president's image, particularly when it comes to uh, his views. Uh, on African-Americans uh, and on police reform and things like that. One of the things that has not happened during this convention is not a single speaker comes up and says, you know, look, Donald Trump thought this and he did this, but he's evolved, he's changing. Or you don't hear, you know, he's become a more compassionate this or he's more empathetic on that. It really is a message of take it or leave it. This is who Donald Trump is, take it or leave it. And I just wonder not showing some willingness to, to change uh, is not going to have, is not going to sit well with sort of swing voters. All right, Chuck. When we come back, Mike Pence accepts the Republican vice presidential nomination live from Fort McHenry. But first, we want to share this moment from the last hour. To Americans who love our country, young and old, be a radical for freedom, be a radical for liberty, and be a radical for our republic, for which I stand. One nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and may God bless America. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. 
how, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back as we await Mike Pence speaking tonight from Baltimore's historic Fort McHenry. Let's go again to Hallie Jackson, who is there tonight. Hallie, what are you seeing? Well, there's a, a set to be, Lester, likely an appearance by President Trump, we understand. Uh, this is something that is going to happen at some point, uh, either during or after the vice president's remarks. We actually here at Her Fort McHenry a couple of minutes ago heard the sounds of what sounded like Marine One landing, and I just ran into the president's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who is in the audience here, along with a number of President Trump's other advisors, allies of the vice president as well. Uh, the chief of staff about tomorrow night's speech said that President Trump's remarks would be comprehensive and straightforward forward and said the president is feeling good about them. But tonight does belong to Vice President Pence. I want to give you a sense of, I would say, the room, but it's actually, again, this historic site uh, administered by the National Park Service. In the audience, you have a number of Gold Star families. You have members uh, whose families uh, were killed in military service and combat service. Uh, and you have people who work with a charitable group that creates essentially exoskeletons for, for former members of the military as well. So we are waiting for the vice president's speech, in which, again, he will draw contrast with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. All right, Hallie, thank you. Let's turn to Kristen Welker as we await the vice president's speech. We've been showing the, the radar off the Gulf Coast because this storm is bearing down. It's very much on the minds of the president. And also, by the way, his speech tomorrow night, uh, plans are for the speech to go forward. But is the president watching this situation? Watching the situation very closely, Savannah, and I can tell you that officials at the White House throughout the day have said at this point in time there are no plans to delay the president's speech tomorrow night. I just got off the phone with a source who reiterated that, that at this point in time they are planning to have this president's speech tomorrow night, but obviously this is a very fluid situation, Savannah, and it is worth noting that in the past, if you go back to 2012, they actually delayed the start of the Republican convention due to a hurricane then. So uh, this is a situation that can be quite fluid, but bottom line, at this point in time, the plans are moving forward as initially planned for yeah, So many things we are watching right now, and we are waiting for the vice president. He is just moments away from making his live appearance there at Fort McHenry uh, in Baltimore. Uh, he's been uh, at the president's side since the beginning, and by all accounts, they have a very strong relationship. Yeah, he, he uh, is going to give an impassioned defense of the first four years and a plea for the next four. Let's listen to Vice President Pence as the tape starts and his presentation begins. By dawn's early light, millions of Americans give thanks for this land, our liberties, and those who defend it. That same pride inspired the words of our national anthem, penned here as the smoke of battle lifted over two centuries ago. When those American soldiers bravely fought and died repelling the British onslaught, they did so not only for our people, which that flag represented, but for our principles, for which the flag stood, our God-given freedoms, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, equality under the law, government by the people. These are the threads that bind us together as Americans, for we are not a nation born of blood, but of belief. And even though that old flag has sometimes been battered and beaten, faded and forgotten, fired upon and set ablaze, there are heroes throughout our history who have picked up those tattered strands, mended them, and raised our flag anew. Just as the soldiers at Fort McHenry fought in defense of the beliefs that bind us today, there are new leaders who have devoted their life to do the same. Greetings across the amber waves of grain. This is Mike Pence. Across Indiana highways and homes, his voice warmly welcomed Hoosiers each morning. Mike Pence filled the radio waves with conservative commentary, guarding our American ideals. But much like the man who inspired him, Mike didn't grow up a Republican. As President Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. His grandfather was a hardworking Irish immigrant who drove a bus to provide for his family. 
His father served our nation bravely in the Korean War and earned a Bronze Star. Mike was the third of six children, raised here in Columbus, Indiana, with a cornfield in his backyard. The foundation of America is freedom, and the foundation of freedom is faith. It was in this small Indiana town his foundation of faith in Jesus Christ was laid. And from that conviction sprung his love of people and service to others. It was at a church service where Mike met the love of his life, Karen. They married and have three children, Michael, Charlotte, and Audrey. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. Mike became the president of a free market think tank, the host of a statewide conservative radio show, and then a congressman. In Washington, Mike quickly became known as a foremost defender of freedom. He led conservatives in the fight to protect our time-honored values of family, faith, life, liberty, and limited government. Our nation's strength begins at home because strong families make a strong America. Mike earned the trust of the people of his state and became the 50th governor of Indiana. He delivered the largest state tax cut in Indiana history, expanded school choice, led the country in manufacturing, and helped more Hoosiers get to work than ever before. But he wasn't through. ABC News has learned that Donald Trump will choose Indiana Governor Mike Pence to be his running mate. I would like to introduce a man who I truly believe will be the next vice president of the United States, Governor Mike Pence. As our vice president, Mike Pence has held tightly to those threads of freedom woven through our history. Leading with those principles alongside President Trump, our nation experienced prosperity like never before. He is solid as a rock. He's been a fantastic vice president. And now, in these uncertain days, we are equipped to overcome. In times of trouble, some call to retreat from those ideals. But Americans throughout history have lifted them in triumph, hope, and resilience. Mike Pence knows those stars and stripes do not merely represent who we are, but more importantly, what we can be. As the sun rises again on America, we lift our eyes to those lofty truths to guide our country and every one of us to greater heights. In this land of the free and home of the brave. Vice President Mike Pence. And the vice president will walk out in front of a live audience at Fort McHenry. And we should see him walking in much the same style we saw Please the first lady. The vice president last of evening. the United States, Mike Pence, accompanied by the second lady, Mrs. Karen Pence. They say a socially distanced crowd or one that is um, COVID safe at Fort McHenry, a historic site um, connected to the writing of the Star Spangled Banner. Something tells me we may hear it tonight. I think so. Good evening, America. It's an honor to speak to you tonight from the hallowed, from grounds. The hallowed grounds of Fort McHenry, the site of the very battle that inspired the words of our national anthem. Those words have inspired this land of heroes in every generation since. It was on this site 206 years ago when our young republic heroically withstood a ferocious naval bombardment from the most powerful empire on Earth. They came to crush our revolution, to divide our nation, and to end the American experiment. 
The heroes who held this fort took their stand for life, liberty, freedom, and the American flag. And those ideals have defined our nation. But they were hardly ever mentioned at last week's Democratic National Convention. Instead, Democrats spent four days attacking America. Joe Biden said that we were living through a season of darkness. But as President Trump said, where Joe Biden sees American darkness, we see American greatness. In these challenging times, our country needs a president who believes in America, who believes in the boundless capacity of the American people to meet any challenge, defeat any foe, and defend the freedoms we hold dear. America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Before I go further, allow me to say a word to the families and communities in the path of Hurricane Laura. Our prayers are with you tonight, and our administration is working closely with authorities in the states that will be impacted. FEMA has mobilized resources and supplies for those in harm's way. This is a serious storm, and we urge all those in the affected areas to heed state and local authorities. Stay safe and know that we'll be with you every step of the way to support, rescue, respond, and recover in the days and weeks ahead. That's what Americans do. Four years ago, I answered the call to join this ticket because I knew that Donald Trump had the leadership and the vision to make America great again. And for the last four years, I've watched this president endure unrelenting attacks, but get up every day and fight to keep the promises that he made to the American people. So with gratitude for the confidence President Donald Trump has placed in me, the support of our Republican Party, and the grace of God. I humbly accept your nomination to run and serve as Vice President of the United States. Serving the American people in this office has been a journey I never expected. It's a journey that would not have been possible without the support of my family, beginning with my wonderful wife, Karen. She's a lifelong school teacher, an incredible mother to our three children. And she is one outstanding second lady of the United States. I'm so proud of you. And we couldn't be more proud of our three children. Marine Corps Captain Michael J. Pence and his wife, Sarah. Our daughter, Charlotte Pence Bond, an author, and the wife to Lieutenant Henry Bond, who is currently deployed and serving our nation in the United States Navy. And our youngest, a recent law school grad, our daughter Audrey and her fiance, who, like so many other Americans, had to delay their wedding this summer. But we can't wait for Dan to be a part of our family. In addition to my wife and kids, the person who shaped my life the most is also with us tonight, my mom, Nancy. She
She is the daughter of an Irish immigrant, 87 years young. And mom follows politics very closely. And the truth be told, sometimes I think I'm actually her second favorite candidate on the Trump-Pence <laughs> ticket. Thank you, Mom. I love you. Over the past four years, I've had the privilege to work closely with our president. I've seen him when the cameras are off. Americans see President Trump in lots of different ways. But there's no doubt how President Trump sees America. He sees America for what it is. A nation that has done more good in this world than any other. A nation that deserves far more gratitude than grievance. And if you want a president who falls silent when our heritage is demeaned or insulted, he's not your man. Now, we came by very different routes to this partnership. And some people think we're a little bit different. <laughs> but you know, I've learned a few things watching him. Watching him deal with all that we've been through over the past four years. He does things in his own way, on his own terms. Not much gets past him. And when he has an opinion, he's liable to share it. <laughs> he certainly kept things interesting. But more importantly, President Donald Trump has kept his word to the American people. In a city known for talkers, President Trump is a doer. And few presidents have brought more independence, energy, or determination to that office. Four years ago, we inherited a military hollowed out by devastating budget cuts, an economy struggling to break out of the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. ISIS controlled a land mass twice the size of Pennsylvania, and we witnessed a steady assault on our most cherished values, freedom of religion and the right to life. That's when President Donald Trump stepped in. And from day one, he kept his word. We rebuilt our military. This president signed the largest increase in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan and created the first new branch of our armed forces in 70 years, the United States Space Force. And with that renewed energy, we also returned American astronauts to space on an American rocket for the first time in nearly 10 years. And after years of scandal that robbed our veterans of the care that you earned in the uniform of the United States, President Trump kept his word again. We reformed the VA. And Veterans Choice is now available for every veteran in America. Our armed forces and our veterans fill this land of heroes. And many join us tonight in this historic fort. Tonight, we have among us four recipients of the Medal of Honor. Six recipients of the Purple Heart. A Gold Star Mother of a gallant Navy SEAL. And Wounded Warriors from Soldier Strong, a group that serves our injured veterans every day. We are honored by your presence, and we thank you for your service.
With heroes just like these, we defend this nation every day. And under this Commander-in-Chief, we've taken the fight to radical Islamic terrorists on our terms on their soil. Last year, American armed forces took the last inch of ISIS territory, crushed their caliphate, and took down their leader without one American casualty. And I was there when President Trump gave the order to take out the world's most dangerous terrorist. Iran's top general will never harm another American because Qasem Soleimani is gone. My fellow Americans, you deserve to know, Joe Biden criticized President Trump following those decisions, decisions to rid the world of two terrorist leaders. But it's not surprising, because history records that Joe Biden even opposed the operation that took down Osama bin Laden. It's no wonder that the Secretary of Defense under the Obama-Biden administration once said that Joe Biden has been, and I quote, wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. So we've stood up to our enemies, and we've stood with our allies. Like when President Trump kept his word and moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel setting the stage for the first Arab country to recognize Israel in 26 years. Closer to home, we appointed more than 200 conservative judges to our federal courts. We supported the right to life and all the God-given liberties enshrined in our Constitution, including the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And when it came to the economy, President Trump kept his word, and then some. We passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history. We rolled back more federal red tape than any administration ever had. We unleashed American energy and fought for free and fair trade. And in our first three years, businesses large and small created more than 7 million good-paying jobs, including 500,000 manufacturing jobs all across America. Our country became a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. Unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanic Americans hit the lowest level ever recorded. And on this 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote, I'm proud to report that under President Donald Trump, we achieved the lowest unemployment rate for women in 65 years. and more Americans working than ever before. In our first three years, we built the greatest economy in the world. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. Before the first case of the coronavirus spread within the United States, the president took unprecedented action and suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. Now, that action saved untold American lives. And I can tell you firsthand, it bought us invaluable time to launch the greatest national mobilization since World War II. President Trump marshaled the full resources of our federal government from the outset. He directed us to forge a seamless partnership with governors across America in both political parties. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing and produce supplies that, that were distributed to hospitals around the land. Today, we're conducting more than 800,000 tests a day. And we have coordinated the delivery of billions of pieces of personal protective equipment for our amazing doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers.
We saw to the manufacture of 100,000 ventilators in 100 days. And no one who required a ventilator was ever denied a ventilator in the United States. We built hospitals, surged military medical personnel, and enacted an economic rescue package that saved 50 million American jobs. And as we speak, we're developing a growing number of treatments known as therapeutics, including convalescent plasma that are saving lives all across America. Now, last week, Joe Biden said that no miracle is coming. Well, what Joe doesn't seem to understand is that America is a nation of miracles. And I'm proud to report that we're on track to have the world's first safe, effective coronavirus vaccine by the end of this year. After all the sacrifice, in this year like no other, all the hardship, we're finding our way forward again. But tonight, our hearts are with all the families who've lost loved ones and have family members still struggling with serious illness. In this country, we mourn with those who mourn. We grieve with those who grieve. And this night, I know that millions of Americans will pause and pray for God's comfort for each of you. You know, our country doesn't get through such a time unless its people find strength within. The response of doctors, nurses, first responders, farmers, factory workers, truckers, and everyday Americans who put the health and safety of their neighbors first has been nothing short of heroic. <laughs> Veronica Sayez put on her scrubs every day. Day in and day out, went to work in one of New York City's busiest hospitals. She stayed on the job, put in the long hours until it was done, and then got back in her neighborhood and help neighbors and friends struggling. Her brother William is a New York City firefighter. And they're both emblematic of heroes all across this country. They're with us tonight. And I say to them and to all of you, you have earned the admiration of the American people, and we will always be grateful for your service and care. Thanks to the courage and compassion of the American people, we're slowing the spread, we're protecting the vulnerable, and we're saving lives. And we're opening up America again. Because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in our first three years, we've already gained back 9.3 million jobs in the last three months alone. And we're not just opening up America again. We're opening up America's schools. And I'm proud to report that my wife, Karen, that school teacher I've been married to, will be returning to her classroom next week. And so to all of our heroic teachers and faculty and staff, Thank you for being there for our kids. We're going to stay with you every step of the way. In the days ahead, as we open up America again, I promise you, we'll continue to put the health of America first. 
And as we work to bring this economy back, we all have a role to play. And we all have a choice to make. On November 3rd, you need to ask yourself, who do you trust to rebuild this economy? A career politician who presided over the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression? Or a proven leader who created the greatest economy in the world? The choice is clear. To bring America all the way back, we need four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. My fellow Americans were passing through a time of testing. But in the midst of this global pandemic, just as our nation had begun to recover, we've seen violence and chaos in the streets of our major cities. President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Tearing down statues is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across this country. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. President Trump and I know that the men and women that put on the uniform of law enforcement are the best of us. Every day, when they walk out that door, they consider our lives more important than their own. People like Dave Patrick Underwood, an officer in the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Protective Service, who was shot and killed during the riots in Oakland, California. Dave's heroism is emblematic of the heroes that serve in blue every day. And we're privileged tonight to be joined by his sister, Angela. Angela, we say to you, we, we grieve with your family. And America will never forget or fail to honor Officer Dave Patrick Underwood. The American people know we don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement and standing with our African-American neighbors to improve the quality of their lives, education, jobs, and safety. And from the first days of this administration, we've done both. And we will keep supporting law enforcement and keep supporting our African American and minority communities across this land for four more years. Joe Biden says that America is systemically racist and that law enforcement in America has, and I quote, an implicit bias against minorities. When asked whether he'd support cutting funding to law enforcement, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. 
Joe Biden would double down on the very policies that are leading to violence in America's cities. The hard truth is, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. And under President Trump, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line, and we're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. My fellow Americans, we're passing through a time of testing. But soon we will come to a time for choosing. Joe Biden has referred to himself as a transition candidate. And many were asking, transition to what? But last week, Democrats didn't talk very much about their agenda. And if I were them, I wouldn't either. I mean, Bernie Sanders did tell his followers that Joe Biden would be the most liberal president in modern times. In fact, he said, and I quote, that many of the ideas he fought for, that just a few years ago were considered radical, are now mainstream in the Democratic Party. At the root of their agenda is the belief that America is driven by envy not aspiration, that millions of Americans harbor ill will toward our neighbors instead of loving our neighbors as ourselves. The radical left believes that the federal government must be involved in every aspect of our lives to correct those American wrongs. They believe the federal government needs to dictate how Americans live, how we should work, how we should raise our children and in the process deprive our people of freedom, prosperity, and security. Their agenda is based on government control. Our agenda is based on freedom. Where President Trump cut taxes, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by nearly $4 trillion. Where this president achieved energy independence for the United States, Joe Biden would abolish fossil fuels, end fracking, and impose a regime of climate change regulations that would drastically increase the cost of living for working families. Where we fought for free and fair trade, and this president stood up to China and ended the era of economic surrender, Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China. He wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of this pandemic. Joe Biden is for open borders, sanctuary cities, free lawyers and health care for illegal immigrants. And President Trump, he secured our border and built nearly 300 miles of that border wall. Joe Biden wants to end school choice. And President Trump believes that every parent should have the right to choose where their children go to school, regardless of their income or area code. <laughs> President Trump, President Trump has stood without apology for the sanctity of human life every day of this administration. Joe Biden, he supports taxpayer funding of abortion right up to the moment of birth. When you consider their agenda, it's clear. Joe Biden would be nothing more than a Trojan horse for the radical left. The choice in this election has never been clearer, and the stakes have never been higher. Last week, Joe Biden said, democracy's on the ballot. And the truth is, our economic recovery is on the ballot. Law and order are on the ballot. But so are things far more fundamental and foundational to our country. In this election, it's 
not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. It's whether we will leave to our children and our grandchildren a country grounded in our highest ideals of freedom, free markets, and the unalienable right to life and liberty, or whether we will leave them a country that's fundamentally transformed into something else. We stand at a crossroads, America. President Trump has set our nation on a path of freedom and opportunity. Joe Biden would set America on a path of socialism and decline. But we're not going to let it happen. <laughs> President Donald Trump believes in America and in the goodness of the American people. The boundless potential of every American to live out their dreams in freedom and every day. President Trump has been fighting to protect the promise of America. Every day, our president has been fighting to expand the reach of the American dream. And every day, President Donald Trump has been fighting for you. And now it's our turn to fight for him. On this night in the company of heroes, I'm deeply grateful. Deeply grateful for the privilege of serving as Vice President of this great nation and to have the opportunity to serve again. I pray to be worthy of it, and I will give that duty all that's in me. In the year 2020, the American people have had more than our share of challenges. But thankfully, we have a president with the toughness, energy, and resolve to see us through. Now, those traits actually run in our national character. As the invading force learned on approach to this fort in September of 1814, against fierce and sustained bombardment, our young country was defended by heroes, not so different from those who are with us tonight. The enemy was counting on them to quit, but they never did. Fort McHenry held, and when morning came, our flag was still here. My fellow Americans, we're going through a time of testing. But if you look through the fog of these challenging times, you will see our flag is still there today. That star-spangled banner still waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. From these hallowed grounds, American patriots in generations gone by did their part to defend freedom. Now it's our turn. So let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on O oh, Glory and all she represents. Let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let their courage inspire. And let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and our freedom. And never forget that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That means freedom always wins. My fellow Americans, thank you for the honor of addressing you tonight and the opportunity to run and serve again as your Vice President. I leave here today inspired 
And I leave here today more convinced than ever that we will do in our time, as Americans have done throughout our long and storied past, we will defend our freedom and our way of life. We will reelect our president and principled Republican leaders across the land. And with President Donald Trump in the White House for four more years, and with God's help, we will make America great again, again. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Vice President Mike Pence with a live crowd there at Fort McHenry, completing uh, his remarks, making the case for another four years of a Trump-Pence administration. He spoke for about 37 minutes and uh, took on the traditional role of the vice president. He went on the attack against Joe Biden uh, on a variety of issues. And as we watch, I believe we're going to, let's see, I'm going to squint my eyes. Yep, that's the president of Elias. Hail to the chief is often a clue. <laughs> you know, my eyes are actually not what they used to be. My ears should serve me better. But yes, the president with a surprise visit to Fort McHenry, along with Melania Trump, who of course spoke last night. And we should note that uh, Mike Pence was the uh, head of the president's coronavirus task force, although became often overshadowed by the president himself in those uh, of those early days. But here, uh, first couple about to greet the vice president and Karen Pence. Let's bring Chuck Todd on, uh, on the speech. Chuck, your thoughts? Well, look, he's the most polished and disciplined messenger, you know, on the Trump team. And for many Republicans, he's the most traditional conservative in the administration. And you saw that. I, I'm, I'm with you, Savannah. I thought he did play that traditional role. And, and, he, and he, he weaves in his Biden attacks with a sunnier way about him. And so when he does it, I think there is a... Please There's a toughness to, to it, but it lands um, without an edge, which can actually be quite effective um, if it's, you know, somebody in the middle. This is uh, Trace Atkins, who will lead uh, the national anthem. Yeah! Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched. Were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the that it was inspired for McHenry, Trace Atkins. As the president, first lady, vice president, second lady, look on in that historic place. We will take a break, have some final thoughts, and a look ahead to tomorrow, Donald Trump's big night, when we continue in just a moment. This 
morning across the country what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment where we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live look at Ford McHenry. Uh, President Trump still uh, greeting some of the crowd there that was there for the vice president's speech. Not anxious to leave, but I, uh, one of the few moments they can have a live audience. Uh, during this convention. Before we go, a reminder, we'll continue to watch the advance of Hurricane Laura, the Category 4 storm about to make landfall along the Texas-Louisiana Gulf Coast, bringing with it a massive and potentially deadly storm surge. That's right. Our coverage teams are in place already. I'll be back on the air at 6 a.m. tomorrow. We have a special report on Hurricane Laura as it comes ashore. And, of course, we'll also be following events in Kenosha, Wisconsin this evening. And tomorrow night, the final night of the Republican convention, Donald Trump will accept his party renomination for president and we'll be there do we have enough to cover these days i think we I do think we do all right we'll be right back here to bring it all to you for savannah chuck andrea and all of us at nbc news i'm lester holt thank you for joining us good night everyone